um, to to this committee. Um, what I'll do first, um, during our start, I will ask all panel members, officers, and other attendees to introduce themselves uh, as I go round uh, to ensure that they are in attendance and can hear proceedings. Okay, I'll first start with the panel members. Um, Nigel Cannins. Yeah. Good evening. Good Good Nigel Cannins. Nigel Cannins, uh, Vice Chair and uh, Pickle and Bodleth Ward member. Okay, Councillor Tosh McDonald. Hi, panel member and councillor for Town Ward in Doncaster. Thank you. Uh, councillor Ear Pearson. Hello, um, councillor for Cunnisburgh and Denny B. Thank you. Uh, councillor Sir Wilkinson. Hi, I'm councillor Sue Wilkinson. I'm councillor for Hexthorpe and Bowlby North. OK, thank you for that. Um, councillor Martin Greenout. <laughs> Council Martin Greenhow. I don't think he's there. Can't actually see him on the on the screen. OK, right. he's not in the meeting at the minute. I'll try and invite him in. OK, Council David Hughes. Yes, yes, President uh, uh, yeah. Councillor for Adwick and Carcroft Ward. Thank you very much. OK, uh, is there any other councillors I've missed? Um, I don't think there's, I can't see anybody on it, on it here. Um, oh. OK, um, Councillor Chris McGuinness. Yeah, um, Cabinet I'm member, I'm thank you. Uh, have we got Councillor Jane Kidd available? Uh, she's not in attendance at the minute. OK, um, thank you very much. Um, OK, move on to the officers. Um, Phil Holmes, Director of Elf, Adult Health and Wellbeing. I'm hearing my dog is whining in the background, so apologies for that. <laughs> thank you for that. He okay, wants Kyle, doggy Ky oh. Kyle uh, Aiden. Uh, Kyle's in another meeting, Mark. I'm going to cover for him. OK, that's Paul. It's Paul, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Carl's not available. David Coulson. David Coulson, is he available? He, oh yeah. Is he there? On the, on, I don't think he's available. Is he, is he not? Can no, I don't think I think uh, I've can, I can, I can covered the, the council angles with, with Paul, I think. OK, thank That's you. He's not well. OK, Caroline Martin. Yes. OK, thank oh. you. Uh, Robert Brown, IDB. Good afternoon all, uh, Robert Brown. I'm technical, technical engineering manager for Doncaster East uh, Internal Drainage Board. Thank you very much. Um, now moving on to the external um, organisations, Gary Collins, Yorkshire Water. Yeah, Gary Collins here. Uh, Thank you, Gary. Engineer. Thank you very much. Ellen Batt, Environment Agency. Hi, yeah. Hi, I'm the um, flood risk manager for South Yorkshire. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Willis. Yeah, I'm here, uh, Chief Executive, South Yorkshire Community Foundation. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Michelle Dickinson. Um, I think Michelle's. Uh, I think I'm here just uh, rather than Michelle as well. So. Is, is that same for Jen Jackson as well? Yeah, yeah. I'll send their apologies. Uh, uh, okay. Um, have I missed anybody? Um, I'm going to move on to the two two researchers shortly. Yeah. Sheffield University. Have I missed anybody off the list? Uh, if I may introduce myself, I'm Andrew McGill, the uh, Chief Executive of the Doncaster East Internal Drainage Board and the Water Management Consortium. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I don't think there's anybody else. from. Uh, from... Chair, Councillor Kidd's joined the meeting OK, now. thank you, Jit, Councillor Kidd. All right, just letting you know that I'm here. <laughs> thank you. Got you. OK, I think that is it. Have we got anybody from the press? Not that I can, we've no. not admitted anyone Any of the now. attendees that we're not aware of? I can't, I'm looking down the list now, I cannot, uh, yeah, that's fine. I think we've got I everybody think that's else. about it. Okay, um, also in attendance, we've got two two researchers from Sheffield University who were observing the meeting. Um, their role as well as, as, as observing as part of a research project. Can I just, uh, just get an acknowledgement from Duncan Chambers? OK, are you there, Duncan? Uh, yes, I am, yes. Hello. OK, thank you. Annette Haywood, is she available? I think she may be joining later. OK, thank you. 
OK, um, with on that, um, just a few housekeeping uh, rules before we move forward. Um, OK, the majority of this is to ensure background noise is eliminated. So what I will be requesting is panel members to keep their um, obviously visual on um, and the, the person who they're actually addressing. Um, so we'll have to start answering the question. Uh, so panel members remain uh, with their video on um, to avoid any distractions. Uh, if somebody wishes to speak, um, if you can kindly raise your hand, I will pick that up as we go along um, on function on the Microsoft Teams. I'll go around one at a time to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to ask a question, starting with panel members and then non-panel members. Uh, <laughs> Caroline um, Martin, the scrutiny officer, will, will help me with this. Uh, to cut out the background, background noise, um, can you put your mobiles on silent? Uh, if people can. Uh, ask the Microsoft chat not to be used and ask that microphones be muted uh, unless you're asked to speak. OK, the meeting will be recorded. Um, whilst this meeting will not be published or broadcast, it is being recorded to assist with minute taking and recording any out. Any members of their images, voices will be retained and broadcast by the council. OK, one final point. In addition, if anyone who is participating in the meeting or listening to the debate is disconnected, officers will inform me as chair when this becomes apparent. Uh, please rejoin the meeting as you originally joined and the officers will ensure you're reconnected. OK, agenda item number one. Um, uh, so, uh, apologies to interrupt, chair. I've just noticed a new arrival, Andrew McLaughlin. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. OK, in what capacity is Andrew acting in, Caroline? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Andrew, uh, would you just wish to identify yourself and yeah. what capacity you're, you're acting in? Uh, good afternoon, Mr Chairman. My name is Andrew McLaughlin. I'm Chief Executive of Yorkshire and Humber Drainage Boards and I represent eight drainage boards within the region, including Dane and Drainage Commissioners and uh, Black Drain. OK, days. thank you very much, Andrew. OK, thank you for that, Caroline. OK, OK, you still got your hand up. Do you wish to? Uh... I will do, yes. OK, thank you. OK, agenda item number one. Uh, are there any apologies for absence? None received, Chair. Thank you, Caroline. OK, item number two, declarations of interest, if any. If you have an interest, please declare this and the form will be complete, needs to be completed following the meeting. Please contact Caroline Martin, who will assist you with the process. OK, does anybody uh, wish to declare any, any declarations of interest? Uh, Mark, do we as drainage board members need to declare an interest? I think that it just just for simplicity, it might just be an idea maybe just to do that. Right, thanks. OK, are you are you raising an interest as a drainage board member? I'm a member of Doncaster East. <clears throat> OK, well, that's, that's noted. Okay. Uh, noted, yeah. Okay. Anybody else wish to raise any interest? Same for me, Chair. I'm a member of Doncaster East. Thank you, Council McGuinness. OK, that, that's noted. Sorry, okay, Chair, can I give you apologies for Laney Ball? OK, apologies for Laney Ball. OK, um, are we all in agreement with that? OK, that's fine. That's noted, uh, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. OK, item number four, minutes of the Communities and Environment Overview and Scrutiny Panel held on the 20th of January uh, 2020. Please see pages one to eight. Um, can we accept this as a true record, an accurate record? Could I have a proposal for that, please? Move, Chair. OK, we've got in council person. Could I have a seconder, please? Could I have a seconder? Second it, Chair. Chair. OK, we have a second. Thank you very much. OK, item five, public statements, uh, 20 minutes up to five people. I understand there's no members of the public here today. Uh, could you confirm that, Caroline? Uh, yeah, I believe there's no members of the public here. No okay, public thanks. statements. OK, so there's been no public statements been made today. Thank you. OK, item number six, uh, which is the flood recovery in Doncaster partnership update. Uh, pages nine to 2002. Uh, 2,234. <laughs> uh, there will be a presentation um, by, I assume, Phil Holmes and a number of the other uh, drainage member teams um, on the winter preparations for flooding. 
Um, what I will do, um, I'll allow the opportunity for um, Phil um, to come in and obviously start the meeting um, with the presentation and then I'll then go round the panel um, with a series of questions as, as we go along. OK, so in, it, in attendance for this item is DNBC, Phil Holmes, um, Kyle Aiden, uh, Paul Evans, um, who will be um, obviously available uh, for, for the questions to be asked. OK, Phil, can I um, start with you first? Thank you, Chair. What, what I'll do, if you're OK, is I'll just briefly talk to the to the report that you've got in front of you today, but I won't. Um, I won't go to town on it because um, there's, there's a lot of detail um, that, that you'd already have had time to consider. And you've also got, I'm just very grateful, by the way, to, to partnership colleagues who've um, who've um, come to, to um, scrutiny today um, with the idea that, that you want to hold us to account, I think, as a partnership in terms of how we're working together for, for people at Doncaster. So I won't go on too long to avoid, you know, and, and, and kind of lose you space to, um, to ask us all the questions that you want to ask us. The report is, is quite similar to the report that went to Council Cabinet. I think the added dimension today is obviously uh, you, you've got the opportunity to ask questions of us as a partnership, as, as I've said, so you're able to, um, to get into a bit more detail with us as you need to. You'll see as, as ward members that the report has appendices, um, four of which are broken and into works that have been undertaken or are planned to be undertaken over the winter in um, in um, four um, localities within Doncaster. Um, and we recognise, I think, as a, as a group that the overall um, issue for people in Doncaster is having experienced a very traumatic time last November and with the anniversary of those floods coming up quite quickly. Um, wanting to feel assured that as a, as a system we've done everything that we can to make sure that they are um, they are safe and supported going into this winter. So that's what we'll probably primarily want to talk to you about today. Um, what we've also done though in, in the report um, and also helpfully I think in terms of the connections that you'll want to make in terms of your wider responsibility is connect flood recovery with the environmental aspects and the longer term vision that the borough needs in in relation to the to the climate emergency so i think that focus as well about the longer term investment and a and a sense that just because if we have a good winter and we feel like everything's okay this winter and we've, we've all done some good work that won't mean that we should stop our focus on flood improvement um, and probably we'll need to scale it up in terms of the environmental challenges that we've got what the report covers is is um, six areas and grateful for um, for Ruth Willis being here, especially in relation to the humanitarian. Aspect. It's important to acknowledge a um, significant number of people in Doncaster were affected um, by floods. Um, as, as you've seen in the report, there's 897 properties that were affected, but a considerably greater number of people actually indirectly affected in, in terms of the trauma of, of watching flood water come into their communities. So the report covers the progress in relation to support to, to Doncaster people and acknowledges, as I say, that the anniversary itself will be quite traumatic. Um, the report talks about further work in communities. Unfortunately, COVID really limits what we can do in terms of working directly with communities in the next few months. But we are um, planning to issue clear information to communities so they understand the work that's been done in their area. They feel more, more safe and secure. We've got that work going on back end of this month and the very start of November to make sure that that is issued to all of our previously affected communities. There's also clarity in the report around the financial support that that was given um, and not only at household level, but also in terms of the community schemes in, in terms of um, building more flood um, resistant or, or adapting, I should say, more flood resilient properties. The report covers our work around household insurance um, and at, indeed at the flood summit recently convened across South Yorkshire there was discussion around insurance and the need to make sure that there was a robust offer to Doncaster people and, and people in other areas so that they don't um, find themselves underinsured or uninsured because of prohibitively expensive premiums. So we've picked, we've picked up on that engagement with national government. As I've said, quite a lot of, of, of focus and clarity in the report and in the appendices about the remedial works that we've undertaken um, from the environment agency perspective, 
um, in terms of the work that individual drainage boards have done, in terms of the work that water companies, so um, I've got, obviously got Yorkshire Water here today, have done um, to reduce the, the likelihood and impact of, of further flooding. Um, um, I think the the headline assurance that we're able to to provide, I think, is that we've we've addressed some of the key issues in relation to flood defences that we, that we identified last winter and have restored many flood defences back up to their design standards. That feels like a a, a, a strong point. And even where um, we haven't managed to physically put permanent changes in place to particular flood, flood defences. We have temporary arrangements in place to safeguard communities that were at risk or that experienced them, the, the, the problems we had last November. What you have as well is a, is a huge amount of detail in the report in the, um, um, in the in Appendix 5, which is the Section 19 report that analyses the reasons for flooding in, in November 2019. Um, think personally, I think it's a it's a well put together report. Um, it, um, we've we've produced some easier read versions that we're, we're circulating into communities, but I think it's quite visual. It quite helpfully describes how the water came in, uh, almost a staged picture of what of what um, of what happened from day to day, and also some helpful analysis of the, of the different factors. What we're doing subsequently. Um, alongside the partners in, in um, um, who, who are here at Scrutiny today is thinking what does our longer term investment plan look like and as you'll know we made the case strongly collectively to um, the Secretary of State at the recent flood summit for South Yorkshire about the investment that we needed going forward. Um, it's, not a, um, it's not a phrase that I particularly like but I think the focus for us at the moment is maximising the number of shovel ready schemes in and around Doncaster that will mean that we're able to take forward that that program that builds on the work that we've put in place this winter so that in the longer term we feel like we've got a good program that that reassures Doncaster people because it's still a great place to live still a great place to work um, and flooding has been a blight that collectively the group of partners here um, today would want to address. So I, I won't take you any further into the depths of the report because I'm sure there will be many questions that will enable us to get into matters of detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Phil. Um, I just wish to acknowledge, wish to acknowledge the, the good work that obviously Doncaster Council and all the key partners and stakeholders, uh, particularly the humanitarian work that, that, that you've identified. Um, so I just wish, wish to thank people and, and those organisations for, for the good work that they've done in a, in a, in a, in a period that was very um, uh, very traumatic for, for, for many people. So so thank you for that. Um, I'd, I'd like to start off with the first question, if I may, Phil, um, and you've kind of touched upon it already uh, regarding funding and investment, which is perhaps very, very key. Um, so how will Doncaster benefit uh, from long term funding and investment uh, for flood management and its commitment to our borough moving forward. And this also would, in, would incorporate any, any future preparations. So um, can I just, Chair, can I bring Helen in to address that? I have to say, Environment Agency for, for me are doing a very skilled job in terms of marshalling a kind of a, a tactically astute approach to making sure that Doncaster gets the funding that it needs. So can I just bring Helen in to, just to address that, if that's okay? Yeah, thank you. Can, can I just uh, say that if you are speaking, if you, if you can, um, obviously personal choice, but uh, could you put your video um, camera on so we can see? Yeah, it? sorry, lack of coordination there. Apologies. Okay, Chair. thank you. But, yeah, Helen, I'll would ask. you like to come in and answer that question? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Phil. Um, just reflecting, really, I think that the um, the work that we're doing with Doncaster, um, I mean, it's we're, we're having you know almost daily meetings. Um, uh, I came into the role in March. Uh, you know, didn't know didn't know Phil, Paul, or Kyle on the call, but um, probably, probably probably sick of my face now. But um, we 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 work really closely. We work really well together. Um, and I think one of the the most sort of exciting aspects of that is in in terms of, of future investment. Um, so so Doncaster, I think I think the team have done really well in in sort of accelerating plans for future projects. So not only in addressing the recovery works, the repairs, 
but also in works that will reduce flood risk for Doncaster going forward. And I think that's no mean feat um, with the with the amount of work in terms of recovery um, and also obviously the pressures that COVID has have placed on us all. Um, I think that um, there's there's clearly access to funding through the uh, government funding for floods, the, the grant in aid, and Doncaster have worked with us to put forward their programme for, for that funding, which is now kind of going through the, the process. Um, and we'll know whether that funding is going to be allocated um, come what, February, March time. So that's, um, that's kind of a great um, basis on which to then secure further partnership funding, which um, could be matched against that. So, so the government funding will normally partially fund a project based on its, its benefits in terms of properties protected, um, economic benefits and, and, and uh, environmental benefits. But then you usually need to look to secure further matching and funding from that. And I think the conversations have very quickly moved on from um, you know, what money is available um, within the local authority, which we know as with all local authorities, that's very, very pressured moved on to looking at, well, what are the benefits of these schemes? There's lots of benefits for, for, for people in their homes, but also for businesses, the wider economy, for climate resilience. And actually, uh, there are investors who are interested in those benefits. Um, and I think by working together to better understand the scope of those projects, what the costs are going to be and what the benefits are going to be, we're in a much stronger position to be able to um, work with Doncaster to secure investment for those schemes and, and there are schemes right across the borough um, and also schemes that that involve nature-based solutions as well as um, normal kind of hard engineered approach so there's there's both benefits going into um, the work that the climate commission has also been doing for Doncaster um, so as Phil said we're focusing on shovel ready projects because um, government have a focus on that. They're interested in projects that can assist economic recovery. So it makes sense for us to um, kind of look for those projects and brand them in that way um, and hopefully appeal to, to that, that current um, sort of uh, investment interest. Um, but we will be looking at further at the economic benefits, um, the uh, wider environmental benefits and working closely with Sheffield City Region to look to secure funding uh, to match against that that allocated government funding. Okay, can I just just ask an add-on question to that? Is is how much funding has been allocated uh, up to this point? So so um, eleven million has been allocated um, through. This is just um, through the environment agency. So clearly, Doncaster have uh, also invested. Um, that is for projects to repair the damage caused by the floods and to um, where, where we can improve the standards of protection. So mainly focusing on that recovery effort, repairing damage and improving um, where there are opportunities to. And I think, I think that's been really successful in Doncaster. Um, we're, we're not just sort of putting back what was there before, we're putting back better and, mm. and, and returning things to design standards where we've got assets that are, that are, that are old and, and have deteriorated over time. OK, thank you very much for that, Ellen. I'd just like to ask one more question before I move on to the rest of the panel. Um, I would said I'd kickstart the couple of questions. Um, and I think, Phil and yourself, you've, you've, you've touched upon the Climate Change Commission's work, which is very, very important. Um, so how is the work carried out by the Climate Change Commission and Council's environmental strategy going to impact on flood management in Doncaster in the future? So again, this, this obviously taps into obviously any, any winter uh, or future winter preparations? Um, there's, there's various colleagues chair to bring in on that. Um, I suspect the really important point to make, because we, we, when, we, when we discussed recently, um, Council and Beginners brought us all together and we had a discussion. One of the, one of the things really we really wanted to emphasise off the back of that is that um, there's a range of different solutions here and it's, it's probably a, a, a mistake for us to focus on what, what's called natural flood management as the only show in town because it sounds environmentally helpful and it makes it sound as if everything if we could we can just drain a bit more water into naturally then everything will be sorted so our overall strategy to be very clear uh, with people is a range of kind of hard and soft solutions so there's there's a balance to that that, that, that we need to to strike that i think all the um 
both Andrews from from IDBs and and and, and EA and and council are all united on on that on that kind of balance to to make sure that we we get that right combination. Maybe that's something that Councillor McGuinness wants to come in on. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor McGuinness. Would you like to uh, come in? Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that the the flood agenda is going to be very much part of all them documents you just mentioned. As you know, Mark, work's just starting on pulling all that together. That's right. Um, I think that question, though, I'm pretty sure that some of the other guests on this will give you some views on that. I think the whole thing about flood management, there's, there's natural flood management is never going to cure it. There's no silver bullet for it because of the way the weather's gone. But you can put proper flood protection, what you call hard flood protection measures in. And that has an effect downstream, upstream, wherever. And I think people need to think carefully, and I think Helen can come back on this in a second. There's a whole raft of things that can be done that can contribute, but there's no silver bullet. And I think that for me, the point of view is, if you're going to get millions of tonnes of water coming through a system and down river, and it happens overnight and into the next day, you've got a problem. If, if you can slow that down and you get several days longer, or it lasts for a longer period, it can be managed better. And there's, there's various ways that people can look at that and they're aware of it. But one of the things I'm, I'm really pleased has come out of all this, and Helen can probably explain where they are, because the EA, the EA is now leading on a total catchment plan for the Don. And hopefully what that will mean is, whether you're a drainage board or a local authority or, or the EA themselves or you're a water company, people should be able to know from that plan because of the, the improved partnership working, Who's planning to do what, where and when and what the effect of that will be? And I don't know if, Helen, you want to say where that... I know it's in early days, but I know that's the intention, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it was it was, um, it was was really good that that got a lot of support at the recent roundtable meeting. Um, I think, you know, we, we it's not either or here. We need all these measures. Um, the climate change is only going to make things worse in terms of flood risk. Um, so we we need to you know we need to keep driving forward those you know traditional hard engineered approaches. We need to work better as partners. You know you, you wouldn't design a water management system um, to be the one that we've got now. Um, it's complicated. It relies on us working together, making best use of of each other's um, resources and assets. And as as uh, Councillor McGuinness very um, accurately says, a catchment plan will help us. Um, not not only um, you know join the water together um, in terms of a catchment, but also enable a catchment approach to partnership working to understand what we're all doing, provide transparency um, to communities, but also to potential investors. Um, so it's not just a document; it'd be a living a living document, a living um, process. Um, and I think it's absolutely crucial going forward. Okay, um, Andrew, did, did you wish to an, um, ask, answer anything specific yeah. to the question that was asked? Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, you know investment is is a very important thing. I think we we always talk we always tend to talk about capital investment, but investment in maintenance is clearly the most urgent level of investment that we need in the Humberhead levels, which is where most of the Doncaster district sits. Um, a lot of the areas below high tide level. Um, we've got system, engineered systems, including diverting the entire River Don, um, sat, sat within the district. Um, going back to when Mr Vermoyden diverted these systems back in the 17th century. And then we've had hundreds of years of, of investment in these capital assets, which do a job. And as, as I think someone said earlier on, at the bottom end of the system, it's about shifting water out into the estuary as fast as you can because that's the most effective thing to do in this particular area now um I think, so to, to answer your question uh, to, to address the point um i think what we need to concentrate on in this part of the world is maintaining our existing assets and restoring these assets back to the design profile so they're working at, at their optimum this isn't all this isn't just important for fluvial flooding which is the, the flooding that was experienced in this area in November and again further north in in February. Um, it's also been about being prepared for tidal flooding because um, the rising sea levels um, present a very significant risk from the Humber um, in respect of the Humber levels as well. So 
I will keep saying this and I will keep saying this as an internal drainage board. It's, it has to be about investment in maintenance um, to make an area or help an area remain sustainable. OK, oh, thank you. For sorry, Chair, can I just come back very quickly on that? And, and apologies for literally stating the obvious. What we've got in Doncaster is a whole raft of, of assets owned by a whole raft of owners, not least the coal authority and the legacy. So we have got dozens and dozens of pumping stations that belong to ID, drainage boards, I'm going to say IDBs. The drainage boards own these things. There's, 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 there's waterways, banks and barriers that go with them. The EA have got the equipment. There are assets belonging to Severn and Trent, Yorkshire Water, and a great deal of it sits in a tidal catchment. So the tide comes in twice a day as well. Some of those assets have been sitting there since the day they were put there. They've clearly been maintained, but they're clearly of an age where we really do start needing to think in the medium and long term, what do we do? I know of some pumps where if there's a breakage, you have to have parts made. You can't go and buy them. And when you get a pump that's that old, you need to start thinking about how long you can maintain that. And as I say, there are dozens of them across the borough. OK, th thank you for that, Councillor Mears. Um, I'd just like to bring in, uh, did you want to st uh, speak, Andrew, Miguel? Did you want to uh, say anything? Well, yeah, you quickly, up? Chairman, if I may, besides the point that uh, without labouring it too much, but it's hugely important that we do actually get what we have got functioning as it should. And we have had a brand new pumping station just about completed, which is a fantastic achievement by the agency and um, the partnerships that, that were involved in it for £33 million. But that, that protects um, Doncaster too, and it takes the water from the Torn. And that main artery takes the water from the lowland drainage board systems, which then protect things like First Point Business Park, the Amazon warehouses. Um, it's all interconnected and interdependent. And we are absolutely um, reliant on that River Torn working to its full design capacity. Now, we've seen some great improvement because we, the agency have been working with us under public sector cooperation agreements and in increasing the maintenance on it, but there's still an awful lot more work to do. And, and we shouldn't be diverted from that. The strategic view is very important. We must have that to take the long-term view, but we mustn't forget the immediate and, and make our systems work as best as we can. OK, thank you for that. Uh, it's quite relevant that obviously there is good work that, that's been carried out. Um, obviously, with those two projects, with the uh, Climate Change Commission and the Environmental Strategy, um, the issues of a flood management will we'll obviously tap into those 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 areas. So um, I'll, I'll bring in uh, Councillor McDonald at this point, if I may. Um, he's got a couple of questions he would like to ask. Thank you. Councillor McDonald. Thanks, Chair. The first question I want to ask there's a lot of work taking place obviously it's been highlighted to defend the areas that flooded before what i'm what i'm aware of is water like electricity finds its path of least resistance so whatever we're building up we're going to make another path of least resistance what i'm concerned about is all these different bodies coming together are we actually talking to the developers around doncaster we have uh, big developments taking place on the waterfront we have developments taking place, the gateway around the train station and around the Minster. Are we in danger of fixing the flooding area from other areas that have suffered already and moving it to these new developments? Are you working together with the developers to make sure that we're not creating another flood uh, possibility, another flood area, danger area, with these new developments, some of which are right on the waterfront? Can I ask who, who's the best person to, to, to answer that? Definitely Paul, definitely not me. <laughs> OK, Paul. Uh, can can I just point one quick line. thing out, please, Chair? Can I just point one quick thing out before Paul answers? Some can, years ago... Councillor McGuinness, can, I don't mind bringing you in, but can we allow the opportunity for the panel members to be able to, to be answered? It's, and then, it's just on this very point of developers. I was astonished to find, and this is a national thing, that IDBs on the ground were not a statutory consultee for the planning system some years ago, and I believe nationally they probably still aren't. They are in Doncaster. OK, thank you. OK, um, Paul, would you like to uh, obviously answer Councillor McDonald's uh, question, please? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of ways we, we look at this. At the moment, uh, any developer building in Doncaster has to provide a SUDS 
application and a pack to say what they're going to do with the water, the surface water that falls on that area and how it's going to be dispatched back into the, the existing systems. So these guys have to, we, we in our drainage team, we look at all these planning applications that come in and we assess the uh, the modelling that they've put forward and do the calcs to make sure that any water that's going to come off is is catered for, is either hosted in a, a retention bay, a retention bay, a retention pond, <laughs> or it's uh, oversized pipes, or there's a pumping station, or there's some kind of feature that will stop that water from coming on and causing us a second problem. Uh, there's there's loads of selections around Doncaster where we've we've got this in in place now, but to back that up, we're actually going to start implementing a suds policy, which looks at the council taking responsibility for these uh, assets, taking on uh, the maintenance and the uh, the ongoing operation to make sure that if there are problems with these uh, these features, they're quickly tackled during times of heavy rain and they're put onto our critical infrastructure list so we can check them out and make sure that what Councillor McDonald were talking about earlier doesn't doesn't actually happen. So there is something in place now and we are working to improve that and add a little bit more uh, reach from the council's perspective to be able to control it. So it's not just a private developer putting in what suits them, it's a private developer putting in what suits us and what suits Doncaster's uh, ongoing flood risk for surface water. Councillor McDonald would like to reply to, to, to that to reply. Yes, yes, Chair, and thanks for the response about the surface water, but I was actually, my question was more about not surface water, but flood water again. As I said, if we make, we're making defences for areas that are flooded now, if we're creating new areas, some of them residential, on the waterfronts, how are we making sure that another flood, another tidal flood, if you like, or, or whatever, doesn't move from the defences we've made good to the yep. new developments on the waterfront? I, I'm not particularly as concerned about surface water from the new developments. It's the water from the Don or wherever else flooding these new developments, that making sure the defences are there to stop flooding in these new developments, as well as the existing flood areas. Right, no problem. We uh, we obviously will address this as part of the application uh, planning application to see what risk it's going to hold in, and if we will bring in the uh, the IDBs and the EA to comment on issues where they're building near, near the river. I'm not sure of any in, in Doncaster at the moment that will have that risk from the tidal influence because the tidal influence is all the way up to uh, to Bentley St Mary's Bridge. Uh, but there's no plans, I don't think, to build any properties within the washland areas around that location. So when things are built like this, they will have, uh, and I think there's one in Kirk Sandal at the moment, there is a secondary bank to offer extra protection should it top, or it's on the side of the river that's opposite the washland, so it's a higher bank, it, so it will never actually flood over the top of that side. So there are things in place to try and tackle this, uh, but without looking at the specifics, uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a, a general answer other than we do address these ones as they come up. OK, so thank you for that, Paul. Um, Andrew, did, are you wishing to comment on this, please? Yeah, just a, just a couple of um, points uh, addressing Councillor McGuinness's uh, point. No, IDBs are not statutory consultees. Um, it depends on the size of the organisation. We would dearly love to be a statutory consultee. We've just published um, detailed um, planning technical advice based on national gardens, which I'd, which I'd be very happy to share with the council and, and invite them to plagiarise any part of it because we're very keen to manage surface water. But picking up Councillor um, McDonald's particular question, the biggest issue you have on the Humberhead levels, including in Doncaster, is displacement of fluvial water or tidal flows. Um, because the landscape is so flat, any quite minor alteration to flood banks or subsidies caused by coal mining can have quite a substantial impact on, on development in the area, and that needs to be thought about extremely carefully. Now, I've, I, I, the, the local planning authorities have done a great job in the last few years working with the flood risk management authorities in managing development in the floodplain, but fortunately, 
prior to 2006, 2007, before strategic flood risk assessments were brought in at a national level, unfortunately, flood risk on the floodplain was not perhaps given the um, the attention that it it, it deserved. And uh, what, what we've ended up with is inappropriate development. And on top of that, something called climate change has, has arrived. So as flood risk management authorities, we're, we're finding we're having to adapt to inappropriate development by introducing um, flood alleviation scheme, schemes after the event. But what I would say is that yeah, development control authorities do give an awful lot of credence to flood, um, the risk of flooding on, on new properties. Now, we don't always get it right, but um, I think the majority of the, the problems we've got have been stored up from um, a couple of decades ago or further. OK, thank you, Andrew. Uh, could I ask if you've asked a question, if you could take your hand down so I can see who actually wants to actually ask a question. Um, OK, thank you. Um, Phil, you wish to come in? Yeah, just a, a, a kind of comment on, on Councillor McDonald's point. So what, one of the things that probably we all noticed with the with the November floods was that um, um, understandably kind of traumatised communities wondered why they flooded and others didn't. Um, so there was obviously a lot of focus on Sheffield and Doncaster and the, 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 the dynamic there, but there was also quite a lot of local focus on, for example, was Tolbar protected town end, therefore got the displacement that Councillor Macdonald refers to. Um, so there's, you know, we've had quite a lot of technical reassurance on on the in the meeting so far from colleagues, which I think is really helpful. And I think whenever people design new schemes, they are always thinking quite mindfully about the knock on consequences and colleagues with more technical expertise than me around this table will be able to describe that diligence quite carefully. But I think that what we do and then how we communicate about it are probably two different things. So it may be a no win situation, but we probably need to think hard about how we communicate to Doncaster people so that they feel reassured that we haven't just put our finger in the dike in one place um, and created a greater risk somewhere else. And I, I can understand why they would believe that to be the case. We probably need to think about how we communicate in that regard. Thank you. I think it's probably key to suggest that, you know, it's always very key to, to, to work with, with developers, uh, you know, prior to, to any development that takes place. Uh, Councillor McDonald, you've got another question regarding uh, lessons learned and winter preparation. Yes, Chair, sorry, it takes me some time to unmute when I'm doing <laughs> it's this. Okay. Yeah, the, the lessons learned and winter, just before I do, I'll just say on the uh, subject I raised, question I raised earlier, I just wonder how we have a development taking place in Doncaster called the waterfront development just months after these floodings, how wise that would be and whether it will create uh, concerns amongst the residents. But we, we had the flood in, in 2007 and obviously I, I read in the report that um, we required after flooding to have a section 19 investigation, I think it's 6.1 in, in the report. What lessons weren't learned after the seven floodings and have they been learnt this time? What have you learnt differently from the this year's floods to what we didn't learn from the 2007 floods? OK, who's the best person to ask this? Okay, Do, you Do you want me to come back on? OK, Paul, Paul it's, it's, you're in the hot seat again. <laughs> no problem. Uh, in terms of winter readiness and uh, and what we as Doncaster Council have learned is uh, that the, the main feature is we're just too under resourced as a flood risk team. So in 2007, I think we had uh, two staff working in the flood risk team. They were then joined later on following uh, that flood with another uh, four people. And even that with the, the size of the area we've got with the, the complexity of the catchment, uh, it's just not enough to uh, to be able to deliver some of these schemes and, and get these schemes to a place where they're, they're almost shovel ready for when funding streams are made available so we can actually build and, and start to uh, protect. Uh, so we've uh, just gone out and we've got an extra six people joining the team. Uh, the final interviews for that, uh, that recruitment process will uh, finish today. Uh, and we're hoping by Christmas we'll have uh, 12 full-time employees working purely on drainage and flood risk. 
in terms of what we've done for winter readiness, uh, following the, the floods, we've uh, we've looked at 40,000 uh, extra gully cleansing uh, operations and the connections. Uh, and we're now back on track with our normal cyclic uh, program of gully cleansing and, uh, and sewer connections. We've been and done a lot of uh, desilting work in our ordinary watercourses, so our, our streams, our highway ditches and dikes. Uh, and we've done some uh, some stabilisation in areas where because of the, the, the length of time they were underwater, especially around Fish Lake area, it led to a few slippages. Uh, we've also learned a lesson from 2007 in that we've got uh, 20,000 sandbags now on store. So we two Doncaster based companies, one in Thorn, one in uh, in Arnthorpe. Uh, we've got 10,000 each at each of those depots and both depots can then when required, open up a, a manufacturing line to keep those sandbags coming as long as we need them. Uh, we've also got 2000 bags stored at North Bridge Depot so that we can uh, quickly get out and, and start issuing where needed. We've also changed our sandbag policy. So the way we actually uh, distribute sandbags is going to change from the uh, the November event. So we're, we're quicker off the mark, if you like. Uh, and we've also got a couple of areas, Conisborough and Fish Lake, where they've identified storage areas and we're going to be uh, putting some local uh, standbag stocks in those areas so they can quickly access them uh, should something uh, happen relatively quick and take us by surprise. Uh, we're also looking out of the 800 other properties that were flooded, uh, 500 have been identified that they would benefit from uh, pre-placement of what we call hydro sacks. So it's, it's a dry sandbag. Obviously, it activated by water and it can store up to 20 uh, litres of water. Uh, so we're going to be providing uh, 10 bags to each of these properties. The tricky thing at the moment and what we're trying to work out is how we get these uh, sandbags into these properties during COVID, but also how we get these sandbags into these properties and don't alarm anybody that we think something's coming. So we're trying to uh, delicately and it's a bit hard for us engineers to be delicate and uh, but we're trying to find the best way of actually getting these into properties. Uh, we've also looked at St Mary's Bridge which went which caused a problem in uh, 2007 due to leakage so the EA have uh, done some structural calculations on that wall uh, and they put a temporary winter ready I might be stealing Helen's funder here but they they're putting a temporary uh, winter ready measure in place and they're confident that that will hold until a more permanent uh, works can be carried out. We're also looking in Conisborough to uh, desilt in uh, Kearsley Brook, which our records date back 12 years and we can't find a record of it being cleansed in all that time. So we will be cleansing the, the brook and the mill pond. Uh, we're just waiting for an EA permit to do that. But as soon as we receive the permit, our contractors are going to be straight on the ball uh, and carrying that works as soon as possible. We've also, we've been operating a, a PFR scheme, so property flood resistance, uh, resilience, sorry, and we've managed to secure an extra 75K to push towards some of the community schemes. So this is not gonna be winter ready, but this is where we're moving as a lesson learned to try and not just take individual properties and add a flood door or a, a, a gate or some kind of, uh, air brick blocker or something like that to try and add more resilience to that property but we're trying to make the areas more resilient as well by com combining their funding and we've managed to get 75k additional funding for that so that that's where we are there the lessons learned are we were just under resourced to react to the scale of the uh, the situation we're no longer touch wood <laughs> going to be like that and we've uh, we're now obviously planning, not just planning for reacting, but we're planning for building future infrastructure projects and getting schemes ready. Even if they're not going to go live now, we're going to be ready for when funding streams become available so we can be at the top of the list to, to get that scheme in and get that scheme built. So that's that's the lessons we've learned is to, to plan better and to put these measures that I've just told you about in place for, for next time. Touch wood, it's a long time. Uh, Away. Thank you, Paul. I think that's very, very well answered there. Could, could I bring in uh, Ella to um, probably touch upon a few more points that Councillor McDonald's raised? And I'll allow Councillor McDonald to reply. 
Um, yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting question because, um, well, yeah, you, you sort of think um, these ha these things happen. You know, uh, everybody uh, reacts and responds. There's a lot of scrutiny. There's a lot of uh, focus, and then it kind of goes away, and you wonder what has been learned. Um, I think I'm probably not the only flood professional on the call that that uh, was it was in that game um, back in 2007. Um, I think that from a from a hydrology perspective, the two events, 2007, 2019, were were sort of spookily similar. So the the rainfall that led up to the event itself, and then and then the rain that that, that fell in those days um, during the, uh, the the flooding was it was incredibly similar to 2007. Um, so in both cases, there'd been um, a significant amount of rain leading up to the event, which caused saturated catchment, and then similar levels of rain, which 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 resulted in in very very similar river levels th throughout the catchment. But back in 2007, um, I think it was about 5,000 properties flooded. Um, of, of course, the, the impacts in 2019 were, 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 were devastating. Um, and, and, you know, it's still, still a sort of impact that, that we, can't, uh, we can't live with as a, as a region. Um, but I think one of the, I suppose, you know, one of the lessons that the defences, the investments that's happened since 2007 uh, worked, it protected a lot of properties. And I, and I think one of the key things that we've learned or that we've worked on is um, it, our ability to secure investment. So, so after 2007, I think it's fair to say that, that it took a long time for that money to start coming into South Yorkshire um, and for defences to be built, particularly in, in, in Sheffield. Um, it, it was very reliant just on, on government funding. And if that funding wasn't there and if the council couldn't, couldn't, couldn't afford it, then, then it, it didn't happen. And I think what we've done and local authorities have done have, have successfully interested other stakeholders in flooding. Um, so Sheffield City Region, we've been working closely with them for about three years now to develop relationships to um, to try and bring forward partnership funding um, to convince them of the economic benefits of investing in flood risk. And so that relationship is, is mature and, and ready and, and, you know, for them to lead in, in putting forward a, a program of 27 priority projects for South Yorkshire and submit that to government in February. That, that's indicative of already strong relationships and a, and a strong buy-in. Um, the, the mayor, um, Sheffield City Region Mayor has been a strong advocate and, and I think, you know, having that support to keep that in, uh, in, the, in, you know, right at the top of the priorities for the region and to be able to secure the round table, for instance, and keep that um, under the nose of the Secretary of State and the ministers, that that's indicative of work, you know, prior to the floods that that we can now build on and bring that investment in. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Uh, Gary, um, Yorkshire Water, would you, would you like to uh, just make a brief comment at all, please? Yeah, I think it's just, um, I mean, Helen's touched on a lot of it. I think um, talking about the lessons learned from 2007, as Helen said, there's a few of us who were sort of around and involved in flooding on this call. Um, and I think one of the, the main things really from 2007, the difference between 2007 and nowadays is, is actually how much more the flood risk management authorities actually work together um, a lot more um, and how, you know, we share a lot more information and, and try and work a lot more co collaboratively. Certainly after 2007, um, you know, bit or you know, around the time of the floods, there was very little communication between sort of the councils and the water company and the environment agency. Um, whereas now, you know, we're, we're regularly um, regularly meet to to discuss flooding. We regularly work together to actually try and reduce flooding, um, and obviously not just from the river, but from other sources as much as we can. Um, and having been involved in 2007, and you know, now now. The, the difference in the working together and the collaborative approach that we've got, um, well, it's challenging. It is night and day um, from what it was previously. So there's been a lot of progress on that being made. OK, thank, thank you for that, Gary. Um, it's quite clear that, you know, through through the report is there has been, you know, copious amounts of obviously uh, working together and partnership working with key stakeholders. Um, um, Council McDonald, would you like uh, right to reply? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for all the responses. I mean, I, I do think the, the key thing that's coming across is that there's more joined up thinking now than perhaps there was in 2007. But all the different departments talking to each other and working together, 
and I say that needs to be planning as well with the developments, new developments that's coming along. If I can, Chair, I'd just take a little bit of a liberty because it was mentioned early on in the in the meeting about Vermoulin. And I must say, we, as, as somebody, we have to, we actually have a caravan at West Stockers where the River Trent, the River Idle and the Chesterfield Canal all, all meet. And there actually is a tidal wave that's fairly regular there. That tourists come and actually watch it when it's going to happen. And there's been no flooding there at all. So it can be done. You know, nature can be harnessed in a safe way. And hopefully by all thinking together, we come in the right way on this. So thanks very much, Chair. OK, thank you. Uh, I don't know, Gary, if you uh, still got your hand up. Um, OK, uh, Andrew, uh, would you like to just briefly comment on that and I'll move on to the next question? Yeah, just adding to Gary's comments and supporting those. I mean, myself and Gary were at East Yorkshire where we had 14,000 properties went underwater in 12 hours. And over the last, you know, 13 years, we've developed some really big, successful schemes and we've had to find out the hard way. The offer is don't find out the hard way, pick the phone up. Um, I'm very willing to speak to colleagues to support, um, you know, delivering schemes as much as I can and, and give our experience because there's a lot of people out there now since 2007 have a lot of experience in delivering some very big schemes and successfully. All I'm saying is, you know, inviting the council to use that knowledge it is out there. OK, th thank you, Andrew. Um, would you like to take your hands down once you've asked to answer the question, please, so I can see who's, uh, who's available? OK. OK, next question, a couple of questions. Uh, Councillor Pearson, um, you've got a couple of questions on vehicles and I believe communication. I have indeed, but what I'd, I'd really like to start with, Chair, is obviously uh, I live in Coningsborough. We were the first to be hit sort of uh, 12 hours before uh, everybody else were hit. Uh, at the moment, at this moment in time, we're seeing massive amounts of inactive springs become active again because the subaquas are now filling up as they were 10, 20, 50 years ago. And we're having uh, water bubble out of the ground uh, and it all heads down the hill to the areas where the flooding is and also across the railway and, and uh, what have you. Uh, yet nobody seems to be bothered to try and trace these springs uh, to see if we can stop these big lakes that are underneath the crags from filling up again. I, I worry that uh, just it coming down the Don is not the truth. Lot, a lot of our properties are getting flooding in their cellars and they may be 40 or 50 years since they were built, but the uh, water that's moving is not moving down the river. It's moving down through the crags and through the village into the bottom of the valley. Uh, I, I, my first question is, is anybody actually bothered the fact that uh, we're going to get massive water springs appearing and running for years unless some action is taken, which will affect the flooding and cause earth movement. And my second part, you're quite right, was about we appeared to have no vehicles that had uh, exhaust pipes above their cabs uh, so as they were able to deliver sandbags into awkward and flooded areas. And in relation to our telephone communications, uh, I would say that our switchboard was overwhelmed by members of the public phoning in um, and we didn't appear to have a separate setup for councillors to be able to get information so as they could disseminate it much more in a local sort of bronze uh, level communications back to our plan to go to localism. Um, and this winter, uh, as I say, we've got water coming out of the ground now. Um, are we prepared and do we have the facilities uh, to deal with a mass phoning and get the sandbags or the hydro bags to the right place without the vehicles having their exhaust pipes fill up with water. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Person. Um, there's a couple of points there: vehicles, uh, springs, and obviously communication. Um, communication. Phil, would you like to probably maybe answer one or two of those those areas? Yeah, I think um, I think Paul provides some more detail than me on on these points, but I think um, it builds Perhaps on, on what, the communication aspect. I think that might be. Yeah, no, I think, uh, but I think, but I think it, it builds on what on what on, on what Paul said earlier. I think Councillor Pearson. So, and it, I, I, obviously, I'm not going to address your point about the kind of aquifers and the subterranean flow. So, I'll, hopefully, some technical colleagues can pick that up. But in relation to response, I think that what we set out in the report, um, first of all, is kind of confidence in our kind of diagnostic ability, you might say, um, in relation to um, predicting, understanding water levels and responding to those. So we've picked up some um, um, some lessons from last year about a quicker response in relation to, to water levels and a more unequivocal response. We've, Paul's already covered the, the point about deployment of sandbags. I'm not sure there's any specific anything specific around vehicles that he'll, he'll be able to add, but there's certainly in relation to capacity for sandbags and distribution of sandbags, as well as the Hydrosax point. We're, we're not in a position where we're, we've got a kind of a pinch point around one depot to try and get across the whole borough uh, with, a, with a flood event that was happening in many places at once. Obviously, as you say, it started in Conisborough. So, um, we, in, in relation to um, members, yes, I think you're correct. I think in the initial response, um, the, co the communication with members wasn't as, as, as strong as it could have been. But I think we fixed that in the middle of the response and, and we focused on a, a kind of a member contact point, a member hotline, because quite rightly you were at the front line in your different communities standing with people out on the street and, and them quite understandably asking questions of you that you needed um, clear information for officers to be able to answer. So I think quite a lot of those things feel to me that they've been addressed, but just, if you're okay, Chair, just bring in Paul for some a more elaboration on that. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Paul? Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'll go with the vehicles first if I can. Uh, one of the reasons we haven't got vehicles like that is because we don't want to make our drivers or our, our uh, operatives risk more risk averse. So we don't want them driving through uh, Flood water. We don't want them. Uh, they're not trained to to be technical drivers like that. They're trained to work on the highway and and deposit bags in in dry weather, not wet flood water. So, for actually driving through flood, flood water in where it would risk the engines cutting out, realistically, we we shouldn't really be encouraging that as an authority because we're not training our staff and we're we're putting them at risk uh, by having them do that. So that's why there's there's none of that at the moment i can always take that back to the highways operational side and see if there's any plans for a, for a one-off uh and and provide some training but I, I doubt that that would be uh be forthcoming uh in terms of the uh the, the natural springs uh i think what's been happening there is uh our staff and, and yorkshire water staff speak for, for gary if i can yorkshire water staff are going out looking at jobs that residents are raising but it could be a different inspector or a different operative every time. And they're, they're looking, they're addressing issues, but they're not necessarily picking up on the bigger picture. So they're looking and they're seeing, well, it's not sewage, it's clear water, it must be Yorkshire water. So our guys are then passing on to Yorkshire water. Yeah. Yorkshire water going out and saying, well, we've got no mains in this location, so I can't see how it's how it's also, it must be you. And I think there's a backwards and, and forwards uh, momentum on these calls and we have, to be fair, started to pick this up and we will be contacting Gary to see if there's any potential uh, work that we can do to to sort, solve this problem. Because again, it's not just Connors, but there are, there are areas that are suffering from this type of thing because of the saturation that we had last year and the, and the amount of rain from uh, from August through to February. So uh, we are looking at that one. OK, so thank you, Paul. Can I bring Phil back in? Yeah, I just wanted to... Um, to add to, to Paul's point about vehicles. So I think how I'd read it, um, Councillor Pearson, it's perfectly reasonable to say, well, we should have a contingency in relation to vehicles. Um, the, there's the downside that Paul described, but it's perfectly reasonable to say that there should be a contingency. But the reason we haven't got one, is I think our analysis in relation to last winter is, um, so Conisborough and Fishlake are the good examples. 
um, and the work around distribution and sandbags as Paul's really described, we can take a preventative approach and an advanced plan because it, it might look great to be forging through the floodwater in a, in a purpose built vehicle, but really it's much less traumatic for communities to make sure that we have the right um, response to them there in the first place rather than as we had uh, the fish lake was the high priority uh, the high profile situation last winter where it was the village was surrounded by water uh, where we were relying on farmers tractors to get sandbags in mm. um, those sorts of things we you know, that, those are the things we've looked at this year to make sure that we're able to to address those proactively rather than creating those kind of very melodramatic situations okay thank you phil uh, ian would you like your right to reply yes please chair I hear what you say about Fish Lake and the tractors, but they weren't doing it here and residents were putting sandbags in their car and having to drive three or four hundred yards to unload the sandbags. And they're still getting the sand out of the cars today. And many sandbags were destroyed in the moving of it. Um, the training is much like gritter training um, for these vehicles. And in fact, you can use the same basic chassis to uh, do it as is used on a, a swappable body on the, the gritter truck. So it's not beyond the wit of uh, highways uh, trainees to learn how to do it. It's uh, fairly easy to do. Uh, so please, would somebody look at it in that light? Uh, and your confidence on the communication of our telephone system and what have you. I'm pleased to hear it, but I don't want to find that we're going to spend another three million pound on a telephone system that fails when it does actually get to be required to work seriously. So again, you know, the emergency planning uh, networks the separate phone networks, the emergency coding on phones that does exist. I'd like to see a lot more of that sort of idea as is used in the Midlands and in London for you know, severe flooding requirements brought into Doncaster because uh, some of the reports uh, that we're talking about, uh, the Dutch managed to build these uh, drainage systems 400 years ago and we spent the last 300 years trying to destroy it. Uh, I can honestly say that I can go back to the 60s and Cunnisborough flooding and yet every time somebody points out these springs they're poo-pooed until water bursts out the ground or until somebody finds that their house is going to sink into the ground, very much similar to what happened in the black country in the 70s, 80s and 90s, when the ground opened up because it's a limestone area. So, you know, I would rather like to think that we, uh, we're more than about this stuff, that uh, in today's world, the technology exists to know, uh, you know, we have roads called uh, Wellgate, that should indicate there's a lot of water under it, but we seem to ignore local knowledge. So I would ask people to think more about what history tells us okay. rather than uh, what they think, because history tends to be right. OK, thank you for that, Ian. Very much appreciated. Uh, just just to pass comments on that, um, obviously very, very active as a council during the floods. Um, obviously what I observed in Fish Lake, Fish Lake early response you do get um obviously specialist teams like search and rescue south yorkshire fire service who, who are there mainly as first response teams um with regards to doncaster council um at the first availability when they were able to do so um they did it obviously obviously attend the scene but paul is is, is right um it is a specialist area uh, doncaster council employees officers uh, in certain areas and not uh, specialised in, 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 th in those areas. However, um, I think lessons have been learned and I'm quite quite confident that in the future, you know, we can be reliant on search and rescue, even international rescue to certain, in certain certain terms um, and specialist teams to 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 get there, you know, the first opportunity. Um, OK, um, I'm moving on from there. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask the next question before I bring in Nigel and Martin. Um, and it's just relating to the actual report itself. 
Um, could I ask what, what difficulties uh, did the authority and obviously key stakeholders involved in the report had in undertaking the review um, in, the, in, in the time frame? You know, so what difficulties did you have in, in actually putting the report together uh, to ensure that you know the robust report that's been placed before us it was was timely? That's probably one for maybe maybe for you, Phil. I think. <laughs> Again, it might be one where I'm just a warm up act for Paul because Paul and colleagues right. did the hard work around the Section 19 report. Clearly, okay. it was clearly it was produced um, at a at a time when the first wave of COVID was hitting us. So there was a, certainly a, a logistical issue there. Um, and also, I think even prior to COVID, the conversation we had as, as an authority was um, the balance between trying to do something very quickly um, in relation to it feeling very raw, obviously, uh, in, in last winter in relation to balance with trying to do something with appropriate speed, but also properly. So it, feel, it feels to me, maybe I would say this, that Paul and colleagues have struck the right balance in getting something that feels like it's um, been as quick as we could manage it in terms of the, of, of the COVID emergency, but also is sufficiently clear and comprehensive to enable us collectively with partners on this call to approach the future and think about what we need to invest in and where we, what we need to prioritise. But Paul can probably provide some more specific responses about Living, living the dream, I think, Paul, in terms of putting that report together um, and, and making it happen. Th thank you, Paul. Ooh. Hello, Paul, are you there? Ooh. He's just dropped off it. Maybe that the trauma of recording putting the report right. together is too much for him and he's had to go and take a breather. Okay. I see okay. we can get him back in. OK, thank you. I think I mean, what I'm trying to draw out there is, is obviously the, 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 the report is complex. Um, there's nearly 200 pages and there's obviously quite, quite a lot of teamwork and partnership work been going on behind the scenes with all all parties and to put that report together um, in, in, in the time that's given may, may well be a man of task. So what I'm trying to draw out is that, you know, has there been any difficulties? Because in the event, you know, if you're preparing for uh, eventualities of flooding in the future, um, you know, there may well be another Section 19 report that that, that we have to do. Um, so what I'm trying to draw out there is, you know, what what were the difficulties in 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 making that report, if if any, if any difficulties. I don't Adam, think I don't think Paul's uh, Paul's. I think he's uh, took a vacation. I think. Oh, no, I um, think he's in. Is he Paul? Are you there? Sorry about that. That was some timing, weren't it? To uh, okay. jump me out, just allowed to speak. OK, thanks. Did you pick up on what I said there regarding the um, the question I asked? It, about it, the, uh, why it took so long or, or the no, no, Well, not not why it take, took so long as such, but, you know, were there any difficulties in, 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 in obviously putting the, putting the report together? Uh, because obviously it was a wide ranging, um, obviously it's a wide ranging task uh, involving obviously lots of key stakeholders in, in, in that report. So w were there any difficulties? Obviously, COVID would, would play a major factor but yeah. are there any any major difficulties um, or even even positives actually um, in, in in putting that report together? Yeah, I mean the difficulties were at the time we had to do the procurement for the report. We were also very stretched with dealing with uh, ongoing uh, events, so high river levels and high rainfall predicted and uh, amber uh, flood warnings. So we were uh, we were reacting and procuring at the same time. So. Uh, we had to piece together specification because this section 19 is stage one. So this was really look at the causes of flooding, look at the uh, possible options moving forward for addressing those causes of flooding. Uh, and that's where we're at at the moment. So the, the guys who we got in RAB consultancy, uh, we used the, uh, I think the EA's framework to, to drag, drag them in. Uh, but they've done a really good job, but they've had a lot of data to, to process. So they've had EA data, IDB data, some stuff from us, logs from emergency planning, uh, individual property uh, and resident uh, input onto what happened and how. So we've dealt with all the partners. Uh, then we had to go through a consult uh, consultation, which, which took a while. And it's basically just been the biggest issue we've had is re resource to actually work on it. There's been myself, Kyle and Adam Porter, uh, who are the only operatives who have been able to actually jump in and, and get this moving. So that I'd say that was the big issue. 
we've now got issues moving forward with phase two of uh, of procurement and uh, picking the options that we want, which is currently with Phil and Jill to uh, to finalise, and then we can get cracking with the procurement for the for the detailed plans of uh, how we can move forward and deliver schemes. Thank you, Paul. Um, Ellen, would you like to come in? Thanks. Yeah, um, I just wanted to commend Don Doncaster. Um, Section 19 is a is a legal requirement, um, but the the uh, the sort of uh, I suppose the central requirements for Section 19 are to uh, investigate the cause of the fact of, of the flooding and, and outline what happened. But Doncaster took that a step further to start to outline, um, you know, the 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 options um, and and proposals for uh, mitigating that risk going forward. Um, and that just gives us a great sort of launch point, really, to 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 form those those works going forward. And I, I just think that it was really it was commendable and very you know ambitious, and, and gives us a really good start. Thank you for that, Alan. Much appreciated, uh, Phil. Just think it might it might link to Councillor McDonald's point about learning from two thousand and seven. And heaven only knows I wasn't in Doncaster in two thousand and seven, but my sense from talking to others is. Um, colleagues in the flood risk team wanted to learn from that experience and make sure we had a really strong basis to make the case for the investment um, and and the support that Doncaster needs going forward so that that rigor that they put in as you say Helen they didn't need to they could have done something real quick and saved themselves a, a more complex job and you know and they had every excuse in terms of as as, as, as what Paul said in terms of the very small size of the team which has now been addressed but I think they've been full sighted in the in the in the flood risk team and it's going to be to the benefit of Doncaster the, the work that they've put in. Yeah, thank you for that. I will say it's a very comprehensive report. Um must must state that. Okay, um moving on to the next question. Uh, Nigel, Council Cannons, um you've got a question to ask. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, what recovery initiatives have been put in place since the flooding to help reassure our families? For the future going forward. Okay, who's the best person to be able to answer that one? I think I might, I might like to bring in at some point, if if I can, um, Ruth, because I think um, obviously involving families, I think that the humanitarian aspect of it uh, mm -hmm. is the good work that they've done. So, um, could, could, would I be? Uh, could I could I ask uh, Ruth? Would, would you be able to? touch base with, with that question. Yeah, hello, sorry. Um, thanks for inviting me, by the way, to, to the scrutiny. I don't know if I'll be able to answer all of it, but I can certainly answer a little bit about what we've done and mm -hmm. how we've worked really, really closely with particularly the uh, Doncaster and uh, colleagues there. And I think that we, I was just trying to um, work out, because it's quite difficult sometimes, because some of the money that's come into uh, South Yorkshire's come in um, as South Yorkshire, not just for Doncaster. But I think in terms of arguments about the future and investment, um, I've, I've worked out that nearly 1.2 million has come into Doncaster through actually having to deal with the stress and trauma and health and well-being of actually householders and individuals within the um, uh, just in Doncaster alone, without looking at Barnsley, Rotherham, Sheffield, Wilhelmsley, and what we're looking at today. Um, so what 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 we've tried to do is through the money that's come into the foundation through donations, match funding from the MHCLG, but also just lately we've had some lottery funding as well as to try and put in some longer term projects. Uh, so normally we would fund just um, a short term or one year, but we've, we've actually set up some multi year funding projects. So we know we've got some funding projects going forward for three years. So St. Ben, uh, Peter, St Peter's in Bentley, the, the church, we've actually invested 100,000 into a project that they've developed there around debt counselling uh, and one-to-one -one support for families, particularly in the Bentley area. So that's one thing we've done. We've also done a multi-year funding bid with the four citizens advice bureaus, uh, which is a three-year project. And um, we've asked them to look at, in particular, not to overlap with St Peter's, but to do referrals between the two, so um, that uh, they can do perhaps more um, welfare advice rights around debt counselling, which is a slightly different skill set, but also to actually look at insurance as well, not not to 
signpost to particular insurance companies or undermine the flood re project because we'd see them working with that but actually to sort of explore those issues around affordability for insurance and uh, we did one point even think about could we fund insurance but actually looking at that you know because the flooding has been so longer part if you want know, a wider part it, it might not be feasible to do that and I don't think we'd have enough money so we've got that project going and that's just about to start that's targeting those families and individuals who are effect, particularly affected by the floods uh, we've also um, been supporting credit unions um, and also uh, we've done a, a couple of community centres who themselves were affected by flooding and have had their buildings affected so and we do have just about about £110,000 left to fund community groups and we've been talking to people like uh, Karen Johnson uh, and Natalie and, and people like that at the local authority to encourage groups they've been working with to come forward what what I'd ideally like to see is that we've put in an, um, a, a longer term project around mental health around health health and well-being because because of covid now as well people are really struggling and as, as i think phil and others have mentioned still people living out of their properties um, we did we worked as well closely with um uh, people at the local authority and other partners including uh, keep moat orchard train doncaster college Bentley Community Hub and Fish Lake Community Hub um, and we worked out that we've spent there because uh, we did give bigger grants to those house restoration projects we've spent just short of 55,000 into 10 properties and we've been working with the local authority to make sure we weren't overlapping with the resilience grants so that we could work together on that as far as is possible because obviously the flood appeal is for charity we've got to spend on charitable purposes um, within the remit of the floods but and we also brought in with working with the local authority officers on the ground over about three hundred and sixty thousand pounds worth of pro bono support through the house restoration and other gifts and services that came in so although the flood appeal ended up is ended up at roughly 1.4 million there has been this all this additional money that's come in um, as well and but obviously all that's going to be potentially wasted if we can't get some of the other issues around flooding resolved which people like Paul and, and Phil and others are working on so we'd like to try and support that work in some way by making sure the money we're spending isn't going into um, things that aren't helpful to underpinning the work the local authority is doing so and I think that's been quite a challenge at times because everybody's been so busy um, but we have been having meetings and so that's what we're trying to do is put in some longer term projects so if anybody on this call or knows of anybody who might want to develop some work particularly around health and well-being going forward um, you know we'd obviously welcome that uh, as well we know we've got some flood related projects coming in from Fish Lake and Bentley I think where local fish flood um, warden schemes uh, are looking for I think some of the sandbag schemes that Paul was talking about earlier for future or maybe to pay for insurance on buildings or storage facilities I think we've got a bid coming in from Fish Lake for a storage facility for emergency kits so those sorts of things we do have money for and we'll try and support that as much as we can we've still got money coming in in dribs and drabs but it has mainly dried up now and we've got, just got this lottery money as well now which is going into community groups which has been match funded by the CLG again MHCLG I don't know if that answers some of you okay. well thank you well <laughs> brilliant I think that probably covers the all humanitarian support all in one uh, <laughs> yeah. one speech okay. uh, can I just right, say that okay, I really yeah. would like to say a big thank you to the staff on the ground from the council, um, the, the community hub and, and the, the individuals, though, the, the, the people that have been going out knocking on doors. Without them, we couldn't actually sometimes pay some of the grants because we were trying to work out what people needed and they were fantastic mm -hmm. you know, going in, knocking on doors, talking to people, getting to know the community really well. Um, and I understand in Bentley as well as a result of all of that with the officers that there's an idea possibly to develop some sort of community facility, which if we can support that through funding and other means, then we will do our best to try and support that as well. Thank yeah. you very much, much appreciate um, Yes, Ian, would you like to make a comment before I... Uh, yes, yes, please. I, I I'd like to make two, actually. One, if the, if you, you'd like to send me the details how to apply for some funding for a storage shed for Cunningsborough and Denneby, yep. I would be greatly interested. And secondly, again, we've been trying to launch a project um, about mental health uh, affecting people through flooding and COVID. So again, 
if you've got any information that could be of help to us, again, would you mind sending it, uh, to, I presume, to the whole of the committee? But I, I, because I'm, I'd like to be able to try and make a bid, if possible, in both areas. Yeah, okay. and, uh, yeah that, I'll certainly say if I could, if I could have the details. Uh, the other thing we have launched our phase three grants, which is mentioned in the report. That's still for there. Still is money for households, and what we've tried to do, because obviously we have to be, is trying to link that to where people have had change in circumstances. So just uh, where people may still be living out of property or they're still struggling, as they can relate that back to the floods in some way. We can still. We're starting to get some uh, applications dribbling in for that as well. We've got. Um, We've got about 120,000 left for that. So there is money for phase three grants as well. And we are starting to get some of those in, uh, but it's obviously got to relate to the floods, but it could be if, if there's been a COVID issue as well, you know, it could have affected people's um, well-being or their ability to move back to their property or something. And we'll work with the officers again at the, at the local authority, which we are doing to make sure, and St Ledger as well, they've been fantastic to make sure that we're directing the money in the right way. So yeah, if, if I can have those details from... Um, okay. That would be really helpful. And I'll pass well, I'm thank you, Pearson, and my you. emails on the website. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, I think we can organise that outside, obviously outside this meeting. But yeah. thank you for raising that, Ian. Okay. Um, I'd just like to bring Ellen in. I think we've we've looked at the humanitarian. I mean, there were six key areas out of the report. Uh, perhaps Ellen, um, I think the recovery initiatives uh, from an environmental um, agency perspective. Could you could you actually um, add to that? Um, yeah, um, I, I've still almost forgotten what I was going to say. So, so interested in what Ruth was saying. Um, just, just, <laughs> yeah. just on that a bit. Um, uh, so, um, up, up to um, before I was doing this job, I was uh, doing a role in Calderdale, and um, we, we funded a project um, through Healthy Minds, um, which was um, mental health support for flood impacted communities. It was he uh, Hebden Bridge and Mythenroyd. Um, and we did that sort of on the back of the schemes that we were doing there. Um, so I'd be, I'd be really interested to, to maybe talk to you um, about that and see whether, there, whether there's any links. Um, I think that, that project's, I think that's been probably going about 18 months now. Um, so there might be some, some good links there. Um, and I'd be really keen to sort of support that sort of work. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um Nigel, does that answer your question? Do you wish, wish to add anything to that? Uh, not really. Just if, if there's any other, uh, you know, good examples of um, the initiatives. Okay, I think I think what what Nigel's uh, attempt to ask there, obviously entering into the into the new winter, is uh, any initiatives that that um, you know when may may well be utilised, you know, as part of the those preparation those plans in the event that there is another another flooding. So is there a couple of examples that we could provide? Is it, would that be fair, Nigel? Yes? Absolutely. Yes. OK. Yeah, yeah, no, happy to do that. Um, so I think you um, we, we, we touched briefly on the uh, work to get defences uh, winter ready. Um, uh, Phil was describing that earlier. So that's just um, um, either a, a permanent repair to return that that defence to its design uh, condition, or a temporary uh, repair um, that's complete by the end of October, um, with a permanent repair due to be complete by March next year, or a contingency plan in place that we can deploy um, if if required due to to, to forecasts um, indicating that we need to. Um, so so all defence is winter ready um, by the end of this month. Um, in terms of other aspects of winter preparedness, um, that's around uh, you know preventing flooding. Um, if we were to get another exceedance event, um, then um, obviously we're we're operating in a different world this this, this winter. Um, we've uh, we've ensured that our incident room can be operated remotely. Um, we can issue flood warnings with our with our staff working from home. Um, we've also put contingencies in place where um, uh, the flood warnings could also be issued from our national incident room. So we've got some extra preparedness there. Um, we've participated in uh, the lessons learned and ongoing um, sort of continuous improvement with the um, South Yorkshire Local Resilience Fund, um, uh, Local Resilience uh, uh, 
forum. Sorry, forum, yeah. <laughs> I lost the, okay. lost, the, lost the word there for a minute. So, yeah. um, they, they, they organized a recent um, exercise, Operation Gold Quail, which was, um, which was um, sort of exercising through a concurrent event. So um, testing our processes um, with, with um, uh, lockdown and, 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 and an emergency um, uh, unfolding during that time. Um, in terms of in terms of our sort of operations, um, we've invested in um, more pumps, um, so we've got more of that kind of equipment available locally. Um, also, you might be aware that we're normally quite dependent on mutual aid during an incident, so we'll bring in environment agency staff from other areas. Clearly, that that's going to be um, compromised this winter with COVID. Um, so we've trained our supply chain to enable um, us to um, draw them in in terms of mutual aid. And we've also been working really closely with the military and doing training exercises with them again to make sure that, that, that we're ready in this sort of new uh, new uh, world. Um, in terms of community uh, resilience, um, we've had an amazing response uh, in terms of flood ward, new flood wardens, new volunteers. Um, I was talking to um, uh, Peter Trimmingham uh, a week or so ago. Um, they're in the middle of doing um, training sessions. They've got 17 new new uh, flood wardens. So that's fantastic. Um, we're working with that community in Fish Lake to update their flood plan and also working closely with Doncaster's uh, neighbourhood um, coordinator to um, work with the community in Bentley as well, um, which has been more difficult to reach, I think, in terms of that those those um, you know community groups that are that are available, I suppose, to engage with, um, but that's where Doncaster um, can really can really help us. And I think also links into the work that Ruth was talking about. Um, we 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 need to you know work with other groups to reach uh, hard to reach groups and, and vulnerable groups. Um, so so that works ongoing. Um, We've done some improvements to our flood warning, so that was learning from um, November 2019, um, and yeah, continuing to sort of uh, work closely with communities. Um, you know, Zoom meetings, um, you know, meeting with councillors, um, and and uh, and working very closely with Doncaster, taking the lead in doing uh, newsletters and updates, which I think is you know re really good, really welcome. Um, uh, so yeah, I think uh, that's it from me. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, just before I bring Phil in, um, I think I think one of the, as I understand it out of the report, is uh, community flood plans that are being looked at um, to be to be met, to be done, uh, particularly at the one in Bentley. Um, so the question kind of preempted the question that I was going to ask a bit later, is you know what the council have done regarding creating community flood plans similar to what what has been proposed in Bentley. Now that's that's you know a future uh, initiative that may involve flood warning, uh, wardens etc. So can I bring bring Phil in? I mean I, th I suppose that is a is a is a form of an initiative that perhaps you're looking at doing moving forward. Would I yeah, be? I, I'll probably ask Paul and Helen in, 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 in yeah. combination to pick up that specific point. I think what I wanted to say in response to Councillor Canning's question, just to, there's some very experienced people on, on this call in terms of flood experts that have been around a while. And to some extent, I'm reflecting, when the answer I'm about to give, I'm going to reflect back some of the things I've heard them say in the last week or two. Um, so first of all, when you look at the appendices that we provided with the report, you see quite a lot of phys physical works carried out in lots of parts of the borough yeah. by Yorkshire Water, by the Environment Agency, by the Council, by the drainage boards. Um, and you see things going on in places that weren't directly affected by the floods and things going on that were in places affected by the floods. But what you don't see is, oh, wow, wow, look at that, what an amazing thing. You know, we've not built the Millennium Dome or done done some grand architectural thing, and it's really important to be clear about that. So what what we've what we've done is some very pragmatic and sensible and evidence based work on our existing defences, and every partner has done that. Um, so that and that will help us go into uh, go into winter with with a much greater degree of confidence, as will the greater focus on effective response that we've talked about on the call. Um, but what what we haven't done and what we're what we're not trying to dress up as easy is um, invest in the longer term grand schemes that are required in different parts of the catchment. So it's really important that we maintain that balance. People in Doncaster should go into this winter feeling safer um, you know, and, and feel that the work has been done by organisations. 
they shouldn't feel that there's absolutely no chance of flooding because bitter experience says that these unprecedented events seem to happen more and more frequently. And they should also understand that we have to work really hard. All of us on this call have to work really hard to make sure we get the investment in and the continued focus. Much in some way, someone said a bit earlier, maybe if we have two or three decent winters, we can't go off the boil on this. We've still got to keep the foot on the pedal around the investment and the, the focus that we need. So I just think it's important to give that balanced answer. OK, thank you. Um, just on the on the community flood plan, um, does anybody wish to just comment on that? I think it is a, an initiative that, that's been looked at and it's, it's embedded in the in the report as well. Yeah, we're, we're working with the emergency planning uh, to roll the, these flood plans out so we can feed into our technical parts. Uh, emergency planning have got links with the flood wardens and the EA and other partners. Uh, so that's that's where we're at at the moment. We're, we're waiting for the section 19 so we can feed in specifics uh, and it'll be one of the tasks that the newly formed team will be uh, allocated to and that should be rolled out uh, as soon as possible. Okay. One of the one sorry, things, yeah. sorry, Chair. Just briefly, one of the things that, um, that, um, for example, cabinet members have said to us is, we're members, we're in touch with people on the ground. We've had interest in this area or that area, so it's it's always helpful for us um, in terms of your local knowledge and your local connections. If you if you need to give us a bit of a kick and say, well, I've got a group of people in this part of the of the borough who are actively interested in, in mobilising around this. From our perspective, it's always good to hear about it. And then, you know, there are capacity limits, as Paul's inferring, in terms of how quickly we can get to everybody and, and when. But it's really just good to build as many people as possible wanting to get into this into this space and, and feel that they're practically supporting their communities. OK, thank you for that. Um, yeah, great stuff. Um, OK, I'll move on to Marty. Councillor Greenow, um, you've got a, a question you'd like to ask. I think it's around in yeah. around yeah about the interborough connectivity. Yes. 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 Thank you, Chair. Yeah. And what what it is? It's it's mainly a attention to detail type of question, uh, gleaned through uh, personal experience in the ward. Uh, and I believe Phil Holmes uh, joined us at Tickhill in January this year to see some of the uh, the effects of the flooding in Tickhill. But it's actually a, a village called Stainton, and the uh, the um, the thing was brought to our attention at the parish meeting that there was going to be a, uh, a planning application that had gone in by Rotherham District Council, uh, who borders uh, on Stainton, for a 400 housing development. Mm. And the uh, the question was, where the heck's the water going to go? Um, so we actually asked the question. We got in touch with our engineer in Doncaster that we, we worked with before. Uh, and he should have been at this meeting, uh, Kyle Hayden. Uh, and he put the question to them, and it's turned out that they're going to offshoot all the water into what's called the Ruddle Dyke, which is a stream which runs from Micklebring through Braithwell, through Staten, and into the mill pond at uh, Tickhill. Now, 450 houses, a heck of a lot of displacement of water. So, after a lot of touring and throwing, it delayed the planning, it delayed the planning application for... Um, for um, nearly two years but it's only just been passed now so what they've come to an arrangement is they're going to put big uh, lakes in like much like they've done at the airport site to offset the water that's uh, displaced from where the buildings of the airport is um i don't think it's going to be quite adequate because they use these fancy calculations but the point was that there didn't seem to be any joined up thinking when a, an authority can i just ask what the question is please uh Councilor the question Grida. is the question is, I was doing the background, but the question is, That's fine. It, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that there's any heads up given from one authority to another on major developments. They just plough ahead uh, without mm. any due regard to flood risk. Perhaps they do for traffic, perhaps they do for doctor surgeries, but flood risk must be a specific thing, especially in certain areas. I know Donkers has got a big problem in else, elsewhere. This might seem like a little fish. My question is, it should be put in the procedural practice to look at this issue as a specific item, as well as everything else. Thank you. Would it be okay to ask Paul to come in on that one, Chair, just in terms of the collaboration across um, South Yorkshire, especially with our, obviously, our near neighbours? Well, thank you, Paul. 
Yeah, no problem. Yeah, we, we do get involved in, in some uh, some development applications, uh, especially if it's around main, main river. Uh, but they will again. It's a it's a planning department again, not not highway. So if they don't pass it on to the highways or the the highways uh, engineer at Rotherham doesn't think to pass it on to us because it's a it's a long way off from uh, from Tickhill and and flooding, then we won't pick it up. But obviously you've you've raised that with us. Kyle's addressed it, and we've 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 had chance to have our input on there. But we will take this forward. Uh, there is. A transport link. You were quite right about that. So, where developments affect transport links that are near boundaries, there is a, a mutual conversation had. So we'll try and escalate that through the head of service uh, meetings that we have with our colleagues, and we'll try and get uh, that as part of the consultation so that we get to have a say uh, on areas like that. Okay, Kelsey, okay. Green, do you wish to write a play? Uh, yes, I thank you for that. It, it was just my main concern. It's a little bit of a one-off situation, but it doesn't mean to say it can't happen elsewhere from Doncaster or, or, or surrounding uh, authorities. Uh, it's something which has to be considered. It's just as important in certain circumstances as, as like the, let's say, the transport situation and things like that. So I thank you for your reply. That's good. As long as okay. it's on record. Yeah. Good point. Jeff, can I interject, please? Council person, yeah. Uh, I think it's important to raise the issue of the fact that there is a white paper response being written at this very moment by planning. Under the new planning regulations, the requirement for cross-border communications seems to have been removed. And I was at a meeting yesterday where this very matter was raised that local authorities aren't going to be required to talk to each other about such an issue. And, you know, it may be a highways issue, but this is such a fundamental issue on uh, the environment and our declaration of an emergency that I would ask that somebody talks uh, with Roy with some urgency on this particular thing as they've got a response to go in by, I think it's next Thursday, to Parliament. Thank you. And I think that that obviously is a planning issue, and but it's it, it does kind of lean into what we're what we're talking about here. Um, you, and you're quite right. It is has been mentioned in the uh, future planning uh, policy, um, and the, the cut-off date is the 29th of next month. Um, and it was raised in previous meetings, but I think that you know that that, that can be raised, um, you know, through through to to, to Roy. Um, thank you for raising that. Um, okay, next next question. I'd like to move on move on. I think we've only got maybe another three or four questions to ask um, before we, before we probably uh, finish off. The next one I'd like to ask is regarding insurance um, because it has caused and created some concern uh, with many residents. Um, certainly those residents um, who have not been able to get insurance um, or, or, or can't afford to pay the insurance because the premiums are too high. Um, so why have residents been declined or asked to pay higher premiums by some insurance companies for cover for their homes? And, and bear in mind that, that obviously this goes on into the future um, should, should the event happen again. Uh, Phil, thank you. So I think I think that's a tricky question to answer, and I, and I won't beat around the bush. I think in relation to um, in relation to insurance um, um, and our engagement with government on insurance, I think we need to um, over the next period of time be clear about how we're doing that, how we're feeding into the um, um, to their consultation. As I said, we it, it came up at the at the South Yorkshire summit that the Secretary of State shared um but i think my overall sense just being honest is i think i'd like us to be clearer about how we seek to hold um central government to account or make sure that doncaster voice is is heard on it i see some some other hands coming up but I, I, ruth might also have a view in terms of some of the work on the ground that the community foundation had to do um that picked up its issues around underinsured or uninsured properties and some of that kind of direct exposure that that her colleagues would have had thank you yeah i'm just about to bring ruth in actually uh, with the work with the flood resilience with, with some of the 
um, you know, the, the 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 parties that she mentioned earlier. Uh, so can, can I bring uh, Ruth in and then I've got Council McGuinness and then I'll bring Andrew in. Uh, Ruth. Right, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I just, I mean, just really to add to what Phil said. I mean, we did actually come across one person, one householder who'd got an insurance premium of seven and a half thousand pounds in Bentley, and another person on the uh, Willowbridge uh, caravan park who actually had an insurance excess of two and a half thousand pounds. What we did was we tried to be a bit more flexible because I, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be funding people who are insured. So what we've done is we've not been a quasi-insurance broker, but where people have genuinely applied um, for a made insurance claim, they've had shortfalls in areas which would not allow them to return normally to their properties or, you know, wouldn't would mean that half the kitchen was undone or, you know, we've had one recently where a person's just needed some carpeting um, and it wasn't covered. It's just silly things that insurance companies. Um, we could certainly provide information as required to the local authority on some of the insurance companies who have names have come up frequently and there have been one or two of those who have taken a really hard line with people and we we've we've got experience of people who where they've been maybe a good insurance company not that you'd want to but there have been one or two names that have come up time and time again um and um you know when we've talked to people they genuinely cannot afford insurance and um, so that's why we built into the CAB um, project the fact that they you know they could talk to people about what the barriers are there and maybe could feed that information in um, to the local authority in terms of its uh, discussions with central government and I also took part in the DEFRA um, insurance uh, research they were doing to and fed that information in. We could certainly provide with people's agreements some case studies for the local authority to use and we are certainly under phase three again we will be helping. We've just helped one person in Doncaster who couldn't afford to get their DPC done which is <laughs> and they were only getting a, a great scratch payment for the local. Lock, lock. There was some other extenuating circumstances but we felt well, if they can't get that done I mean that's just bizarre uh, so we've the panel have agreed to fund 50% of that and the other 50% um, the person themselves has found from other sources so we, we've helped where we can to do that but you know we, it's where people have had genuine hardship but we could certainly provide some case studies um, and you know even names of one or two insurance companies where we know they've well, I mean, it's unbelievable, really. But I would say those two examples of those excesses um, were unusual, but they were, you know, they were, that's just ridiculous, really. Um, and Thanks. so we've helped where we can to, to get people, you know, back to some sort of normality, really. OK, thank you, Ruth, for that. Um, Andrew, would you like to come in? Yeah, forgive me, my connection dropped out momentarily there. Has the flood rave been mentioned? Not as yet. No, right, OK. I mean, I, I assume people are aware of the flood reassurance scheme that came about after the 2007 floods. So this is where there's a central government sponsored scheme that's operated as an independent company that um, basically what they do is they offer the flood insurance element to the um, to the insurance companies that offer the product directly to customers. Uh, domestic customers and this scheme underwrites the flood elements of that scheme um, and that this basically that this scheme is funded by premium on insurance insurances nationally which was and this was essentially brought in to deal with the issue of domestic um, insurance so I'm not sure whether you're all aware of this but I'll certainly um, um, make, make yourself aware of it because because residents should be able to get flood insurance OK, thank you for that, Andrew. Uh, Councillor McGuinness, you'd like to come in? Yeah, on, on flood raid, on, on the, the round table with the Minister, a, a number of insurance issues were raised by council leaders, MPs across South Yorkshire. And the response took me by surprise, and I think other people then, from what's just been said, they actually said that they're currently carrying out a review of the flood raid scheme and looking at insurance and, and flooding issues generally, and that paper was due out in the coming weeks. So everyone's eagerly waiting to see what it is that comes out. But they clearly said they are currently doing a review. So all of the comments that have been made today and some of the concerns that have been raised have been passed in and they have been fed into that review now, I'm told. But it's amazing that no one seems to know or be aware that this review was going on. And I certainly wasn't until literally the week before last when I, when I sat in on that round table as an observer. No. 
I just picked up on that within the, the report, actually. I did pick up on that. Um, thank you for that, Councillor McGuinness. Um, right, ca can I sort of move on? Uh, Councillor Wilkinson, you wish to raise a question? Yeah, the questions I wanted to raise was as being answered throughout the meeting. But I do have a point I would like to raise. Is the Cheswell still being monitored? And to what extent does it contribute to the flooding in Bentley and Wheatley Homes Market area? Okay. Do you want me to, um, you want me to sorry, you want to answer that one, Paul? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so, so the, the Cheswell is a is a, a river that's very short and was culverted over uh, 100 years ago, 80 years ago, however however long it was. And it currently runs through the railway station. So it comes back out the back of the prison, out of the canal. It runs under the railway lines, through the French gate, and then comes out uh, back into the canal where the, uh, the canal dock is. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of surface water from the town centre. Uh, when We're not currently monitoring it. Last time we went in was... Uh, 12 years ago or 15 years ago when we did a try to do an inspection of it however it was that heavily silted uh, the divers couldn't safely get in to uh, to check the structural integrity we have before the floods in november had this as a scheme to uh, to look at its integrity its structural integrity because it's mm -hmm. quite old now however that's been put on the back burner due to everything that's happened since november so it is on our list to address uh, we've got to talk to the owners of the French Gate Centre, the railway, mm. because it's riparian ownership, so they own the land, therefore they're responsible for that segment. So it'll be something we do in partnership. There's a very small stretch of it on highway, uh, and then with some land further around that is highway land or council land, which we're looking to deculvert so that we can access uh, easier, easier channels of funding to maintain it. Uh, so it, I don't believe it's specifically causing any problems to localise flooding in, in Wheatley or Bentley or, or the town centre. It's actually doing its job. There is a flow of water coming coming out. However, it could be a lot more efficient and we are looking at it in a long term plan uh, to get in there and actually uh, do a proper inspection. I mean, I can we can take you all down if you want when we uh, when we cordon it all off for a, for a walk down history in Doncaster. But, until then, it's uh, it's queued with other more pressing issues that we, we need to address. OK, thank you, Paul. Um, Councillor Wilkinson, would you like a right to reply? Yeah, it's just that if it was so heavily silted 12 years ago that you couldn't get anybody down, what's it going to be like now? Um, and for the people in and around Bentley and the areas where They've historically flooded for the over mm. hundred years. Bentley's always had a problem with flooding, uh, you, and I just wondered. Um, surely it has to be some kind of contributory fact, con contributory. Get the word out my mouth. Factor. Yeah, it, it's it's not quite like uh, the main rivers, uh, River Torn or River Don. It's uh, it's more of a, uh, a a smaller river that's got a far smaller catchment. So the surface water of the town centre, that's where it feeds in and moves from, and it's connected to the canal. So there is uh, somewhere for it to go and, and discharge out to. It's not going to go onto the river, so it's not causing the problems. And you're right, 12 years ago or 15 years ago, they had a look at this, and it's something should have been done then. However, it was left, and Kyle picked this up as uh, as an interesting project for himself uh, when he first took over as senior engineer, and was pushing that. But obviously, we've had to take a step back due to uh, the commitments we've already got. But it will be readdressed, and at the moment, it's not causing any any issues and is running uh, to a certain level of capacity. Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Council Person. Uh, I'm just going to inquire because I thought there was there was a flight of steps underneath the shopping centre that took you to the culvert uh, rather than using divers. Has that entrance been sealed over by the shopping centre 
ownership then? I, w I would imagine so. Uh, we need to look into it in more detail, but the only access we can get is uh, on the highway, which is further around uh, near the diving uh, centre. Mm -hmm. There's a culvert on the in the middle of the railway, which we don't particularly want to get access from there. And then there's the started endpoint of it as it becomes culverted. So uh, that we are not aware of any steps leading down to a to a culvert. I'm sure historically you'll find that there was an entrance underneath the shopping centre. Yeah. And can I just say, uh, was something I wanted to say earlier. You've mentioned the railway. Yeah. The, the railway services, uh, and I really would like this minute in chair. Uh, seem to totally and utterly uh, not cooperate uh, with with flooding uh, and the cleaning of pipes that the lo local authority has to. We had one cleaned recently where they wanted a, more than a thousand pound a day just for one of their operatives to stand there and watch our staff clean the gully uh, down to Cunningsborough railway station. And of course, they've cut down many hundreds of trees since January this year on the very area where the recommendation is to plant more trees from Rotherham down to Doncaster. So I do think and that the railway authority, uh, which has some responsibility for waterways, uh, doesn't seem to participate in anti-flooding operations unless they can charge for it. OK, can, can that be uh, noted? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Mark, can I just say something? There did used to be an entrance for monitoring the Cheswold under in the cellar, under in one of the pubs in the Holmes Market area. Now, whether the pub is still there, I have no idea. Okay, um, I'm, I wouldn't be in a position to, to know, but can, can that also be noted as well? Can, can that be acknowledged, Paul? Yeah, no problem. We'll uh, we'll look into all those uh, those options. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I think we've had a very robust question and answering session. Uh, before I actually wrap up, um, I'm going to ask the panel members uh, if they want to ask a final round of questions uh, before we before we move on with any recommendations. Um, OK, so if you wish to ask a question, if you'd like to put your hand up, um, Council McDonald. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's really it's not a question as such. It's just to supplement what Councillor Wilkinson was just saying there. If there was an access from a pub around Holmes Market, I could, the only one I can think of, well, there's two, but neither of them are pubs anymore. One was the Stag, which is now Flats. And the other one was the Cheshire Cheese, which is now an Indian takeaway. Now, if, if that's still got access, there's maybe a way of getting in there. But uh, the other one, the Stag, is now flats, and I would doubt there's still access there if there was. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Hughes, um, would you would you like to ask a question? Sorry, I my, my sincere apologies. Um, I, I've missed you off my, uh, my list here. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Uh, Council use. We've lost David. Council use. You had your hand up. Yeah, yeah, I got knocked off there. Uh... Would you like to answer right. a qu ask a question, uh, David? Yeah, right. It's about the eBay. Um, obviously, you know, 2007, we got flooded out. Uh, Bentley. Uh, uh, Adwick and uh, Chobar and uh, Scorthorpe and we're very lucky last year that we didn't get uh, flooded out. So can I ask what maintenance work has there been on the EBEC since last year and obviously uh, what impact has the virus had on the workforce in carrying out maintenance work, uh, i.e. Uh, cleaning out dikes, brooks, uh, culverts, waterways, uh, gullies etc and uh, flood, uh, flood uh, projects to protect Doncaster. So, uh... Okay, thank you for that, David. Uh, Paul, I think that might be your area again. I'm uh, showing my limited uh, abilities here. I'm not 100% sure EBEC is, is ours, but uh, one of the things we, we are doing in terms of all of the rivers around uh, 
Doncaster is and all of the streams and all of the water courses is we're working on with this extra resource that we've got to uh, to start doing walked inspections on a, on a yearly basis to try and gauge issues that we can raise with the, either the riparian owners or our partners around the room uh, today to try and get this maintenance sorted out. Uh, in terms of the work we've done, I think there's been some schemes in uh, in, in and around Toll Bar uh, to hold the water. So the water in the Ebeck backs up, it, it spills out and then there's, there's different banks protecting and uh, almost compartmentalising the flood water. So that's, I think, why it didn't reach Toll Bar this time. Uh, but I think it is an EA or an IDB asset. So maybe uh, one of our colleagues can jump in if. Uh... OK, can I bring in Andrew? Andrew McLaughlin. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe the Apex um, main river starts in Valentine and she's made its responsibility. I'm just going to address the question in general. I think, um, you know, in the Humber levels where we are, there's, there's miles and miles and miles of rivers and water courses. We, as an organisation, we take an evidence-based approach to maintenance, and the evidence is clear that if you have um, obstructions in the channel or the channel is not its design profile, the, the mathematics uh, stack up, and the, any, any restriction in the, the channel of, of the, the water or the river prevents water going forward, which means that it backs up and will spill out of bank. So that's why we're here as IDBs. We're here to try and maintain the, the cross-sectional um, area of the, the channel, which involves tractor flow mowing, moving material from, from the base of the, of the watercourse and, and, that, and carrying out necessary serviceability works to ensure that that's maintained well going forward. Um, as an IDB, we, you know, my team has just taken over management of this area in April. We recognise there's, there's a lot of work to do and we're prepared to take that on the chin there's also a cost to this, um, uh, which has to be borne by local taxpayers. Um, but, but we are putting together a, a detailed maintenance and serviceability plan um, at the moment, and we're very optimistic that we, could, you know, with with the support of the local authorities and the local community, we can put together a, a plan for the next few years to get things into a a, a very good condition. OK, thank you, uh, Phil. Chair, when you've, when you've done your list, can you add me to it? Yeah, OK, Phil, we'd like to come in there. Um, yeah, it looks like Helen's about to come in, but I, just, I was just going to say that there, there is, in the appendix, there, there is a, an action that the um, EA have got in relation to the EBEC, which maybe Helen and one will add brace on now. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Pearson, you've got to come back. Yes, please. Um, I've got a question for Yorkshire Water that's actually quite perverse at this, in this discussion. Uh, we're actually going to land up having water shortages in the future at the present um, rate of use of water. Are, you, are they looking at offering the opportunity to fund header tanks in people's gardens uh, so as we're not getting excess water at one period and lack of water to water the gardens then in the summer in, in a more environmentally planned method uh, as is happening in various parts of the country where houses are now having stormwater tanks that will hold uh, a, f a fair few decalitres for use in uh, periods of drought for gardening, watering and the like? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and it's actually probably more related to my clean water colleagues. So my knowledge of it's going to be um, limited around um, people having tanks in their garden, etc. Um, one of the things we do obviously encourage is, is any kind of sort of um, surface water disconnection um from from combined sewer systems so we would always encourage um residents to you know if possible to have water butts that collect and store water and use that for water in their garden um and if people do that then obviously if, if people are, are paying um surface water rates and they, they disconnect the surface water from the sewer system 
um, then obviously we we would you know they would get that a, a rebate from that and wouldn't be paying the surface water. Regarding um, droughts, obviously uh, other other parts of the the country are, are affected a, a lot worse than Yorkshire are, particularly in the southeast. Um, one of the unique things we have in Yorkshire is we have um, a, a grid, a sort of clean water grid, essentially, which gives us the ability to move water around the region, um, which we have done a few times in the past few years where um, we could predominantly have a lot of wet weather in the east, but um, the south could be dry. Um, and then we can rezone a lot of that water, which is um, which is pretty much why since you know since the late 90s when there was the the main drought, um, and we invested in putting the grid, we, we don't have um, hose pipe bands etc. As such, um, but in in regarding the sort of longer term water strategy, then I'd, I'd need to actually, you know, I'd need to speak to one of my sort of clean water colleagues around that. OK, Could thank you. information be provided, Chair, because I do think uh, for the future, uh, clean water and droughts and floods will all be part of the uh, green, and red, uh, green and blue strategy. So I do think if there's anything that the Water Authority, um, whether or not it's prepared to fund water butts, as I know some authorities have done to help with it, or even look at providing tanks that can be sunk in the garden for futurism, uh, I do think are good ideas. So I really would like to hear more from uh, Yorkshire Water, if that's at all possible. Thank you for that, Ian. I think uh, just to touch base on what we spoke about earlier with regards to the work of the Environmental Strategy and indeed the Climate Change Commission. I think some of these ideas have already been expressed during those processes um, and during those those meetings of, of ideas of such nature. Uh, and I'm sure would would obviously like, like to get on board you know in partnership with with Doncaster Council on, on its on its environmental strategy with the initiatives that you've mentioned there uh, can I can I bring in um, Ellen and then I, I want to obviously uh, bring in Caroline um, the scrutiny officer and then uh, finish off with recommendations and then we we'll obviously move on I have got another agenda item uh, to complete so um, Ellen uh, would you like to come in yeah, thank you. Just very briefly, it was picking up the point about um, EBEC. Um, so we do do summer and winter walkthroughs um, to assess the sort of maintenance we need to do on Main River. Um, so it would be uh, along the lines of, uh, you know, tree, tree cutting back trees. Um, vegetation ma management, invasive species. Um, I, I was just to say that I could take an action to uh, find out what maintenance has been carried out on the EBEC and, and what done for this winter. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, right, uh, Caroline, can I can I bring you in? Yeah. Um, um, okay. Um, there's lots of questions being asked there today, and I think yeah. Um, across the board, covering perhaps all the six key areas that have been identified in the report. Um, we've had some good, um, obviously, there's some good discussion, and uh, very good discussion, um, and we've tried to draw out where we can, you know, obviously recovery initiatives um phil uh, as well um obviously with the winter preparations is what what, what this meeting is is clearly all about is is how we learn lessons and move forward and prepare you know for the next stage in the event that there is um is a um you know another flood occurs in doncaster so um can can you um just just outline some of the key things there um and i'll ask around the panels whether there's any recommendations um, I think m m one of my recommendations was obviously is to note the the section 19 report um, in, in its entirety that, that's come to the panel today uh, and also to note the um, the winter preparations discussion and some of the ideas that, that's come out of, of this meeting and also to acknowledge the good work that the partners um, all key partners uh, have, have done during the flooding crisis um, you know many of those partners are here today um, so could, could you comment on that is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Um, are you wanting to know? There's been a few actions in there. Um, yeah. Are you wanting to know whether there's any further recommendations from the panel or the areas that have been? I think um, it's split into six areas. I, I, yeah. think, I think the key point here today is is to allow the panel to, to obviously look at the winter preparations and, and then indeed, you know, align that with the Section 19 report. So, um, you know, it, 
if there are any recommendations or any underpinning recommendations that that you know, uh, we need to focus out. on. Um, but, but could I just bring, bring Phil in on that point? Um, yeah. I know it's it's, it's not it's, this is the role of scrutiny to to, to, to make that. Um, with with regards to this report, it, would would you say that that obviously with regards to scrutiny that um, you you'd be wanting or not you'd be wanting, but um, to focus on any, any specific area? I know that the the drainage boards, for example, uh, were due to report back to um, scrutiny prior to the flooding, and that was postponed. I don't know whether that would be a recommendation at some point um, for the flooding review. Um, Thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to put a view in chair. So, I mean, I suppose from my perspective, um, I think partners have, have, have done a really good job in describing both preparations for this winter in a kind of clear and unvarnished way and also the, um, also the the focus on longer term preparation and the balance, as, as we said, um, around maintaining our existing assets and, and investing in in additional um, me measures that we require. And also we've, we've had a good kind of grip on the kind of humanitarian work and how that actually rolls on um, in, in communities in terms of the long term impact of these traumas and the um, and, and things like insurance. I suppose my my request would be that you don't ask us to come back too quick. I think in the context of, of, a, of, of organisations just working really hard to add value this winter in, in the context of a lot of other constraints. So my, my sense of it is that um, quite, I think you're hearing, are you, are you hearing about the Climate Commission soon and, and trying to make that sort of connection? What, what I would think would be preferable would be if you consider how to bring those things together in the summer um, and we think about, right, let, let's take a look at that longer term grip. Paul made the point about the next stage of the section 19 a bit earlier in the meeting. We need to be clear about how we're kicking that off and how we can then pull together that, that set of future investment in the borough, maybe do a bit of wash up from, from, last, from the winter we're just about to go into as well and just see how that went. So I think that would be my... Um, instincts would be probably not not for us to come back too quick but have a look at both forward and back in the summer would feel like it was a, a logical um, approach okay caroline we can make that as a, an, a recommendation then that part of the work plan going into next year that an update's provided yeah. as uh, phil's outlined um sorry chair can i well, could i ask uh, obviously the panel members if, if, if there's any recommendation mm. that they wish to uh, raise well, I'd, I'd like to raise the fact that it, next summer is post-election and therefore I'd like to see at least some feedback before the next set of local elections because many residents uh, in various areas will obviously uh, like to see a, a bit faster progress than coming back in just under a year's time. So I'd, I'd like I would like to suggest that it, we have some sort, even if it's just a written report, come back Reason on thing. steps that have taken place during the winter before the May elections. OK, very okay. Very point raised there. I think, uh, yeah, a briefing paper on on the winter evaluation um, for this, this obviously this, this coming winter. Um, whether, it be, whether it be in a, in a, in a I mean, like, I think we're all sort of full up at the moment with, with regards to um, topics and we could have that as a briefing paper, perhaps. Yeah. Um, or an informal, yeah. maybe have, a, have an informal meeting to discuss the briefing papers. I, I think that could be a good recommendation for a, yeah, for a follow up. Thank you, Chair. Um, no problem. A, a, yeah, OK. Is, is anybody, any other panel members wish to raise any recommendations at all? Can I ask one more, Chair? Yes, go on in. Uh, obviously, I, as a recommendation that the, the officers and the Cabinet push central government um, for a larger financial settlement in relation um, to flooding and recognise the, the sterling work that's been done by the staff but even with 12 staff, if we have a bad winter, they're going to be overwhelmed 
and they're going to be COVID flood uh, washed out. So I, I really feel that we should still be lobbying for a, a, a larger supply of money from the government, either through the Environment Agency or directly uh, for our flood team. OK, I think that probably will be OK. Um, I've got no objections with that. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just take advice on that and, and if OK, if the panel agrees that we can leave it with with the oh. chair and I'll just make sure that's OK. OK, I'll just bring I'll just bring um, Council McGuinness in. Um, obviously, his cabinet member, portfolio member. I think it's probably uh, probably poignant to bring him at this point before we make recommendations. Go, okay, Council McGuinness. Council McGuinness. Oh dear. There you go. As far as lobbying for further funds go, I'd, I'd rather it said continue because we don't miss a single opportunity of nagging some poor beggar about money for further projects. Um, and that's at both regional and local and national level. At every single meeting that we, I go to the Regional Flood Committee and the South Yorkshire Flood Committee, it's always on the agenda. The programme of works is on the agenda, the future works and future funding programmes. And we just keep doing it. We've been doing it for some years and, and we've stepped that up. Even if you could step it up, it's been stepped up since the floods last year. And I know even the chief exec, Damien, every opportunity that he meets with the regional director, with other South Yorkshire leaders, that's the first thing that they press for. OK, um, I've just not noted some. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, I've just noted some of the recommendations there. So one of the recommendations or two recommendations from, from Council Pearson is to continue to lobby central government for extra funding. Um, second one is a briefing paper on, on the winter evaluation regarding the, 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 the floods, obviously to come back to scrutiny. Um, I'd like to put a recommendation that we note the, obviously we note the, the, the Section 19 flooding report, obviously. Uh, to note the longer term and short term preparations that have been provided to us today, um, which which has been provided um, and acknowledge the good work. Um, I think that this is partly touched upon by council person as well. It's to acknowledge the good work of the partners and the council and officers and staff and members um, that are involved during the flooding crisis, because it's quite clear there has been a, a whole partnership approach uh, during, during that period. Uh, and we're also witnessing that same kind of partnership approach now during the COVID period. Um, and I'd like to say as well, the emergency planning, although this is not a recommendation, it's just a statement, um, that during that, that during these periods with the Atfield Moors fires, with the, the flooding and now COVID, um, then them, themselves have become very, very resilient. Um, and I wish to commend, you know, the good work of the emergency planning, because obviously they've been on a war footing, um, for, you know, for the last 12 months. Um, and a lot of the, the directors and officers, uh, you know, have been multitasking and doing multiple roles. Um, so I wish to acknowledge that good work as well. Um, so would, would that, would those recommendations be be fine to go forward? Chair, you, re, you refer to noting the Section 19 report. Could we not commend it rather than note it? Because I think it's a brilliant piece of work. Yes, certainly. Um, I can add that to it. I mean, they probably could very, do both. Yeah, could note do and both commend. Yeah. yeah, note the section and commend it. Yeah, I'm, I'm chair, just chair. Um, I was just going to ask: Would you like a recommendation about feeding back on the planning, the white paper regarding your concerns about um, interborough connectivity around developments? Yes, I think um, that 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 was mentioned as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. About the future planning um, that we've all attended recently. Uh, that was a question that was was brought up recently. I think so. I think yeah. that you know, in terms of development, I think yes, I think that that would be uh, an idea to bring that back. Okay, then I'll um, I'll feed that back. I, th I know they've had some today because they they've got yeah. tight deadlines, so I'll pass on straight okay. away. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Before before I close the meeting, um, I wish to obviously thank. I'll just go through the names. Obviously, thank Phil, uh, Paul, obviously Caroline, uh, members who are present here today. Uh, thank you for all fellas from the South Yorkshire Communities Foundation, Ellen Batt from the um, Environment Agency, Gary Collins from Yorkshire Water, Robert Brown and Andrew McGill from um, IDB, uh, Andrew McLaughlin, 
um, and also the two researchers as well, which is Annette Awood and Duncan Ch Chambers. Uh, it's been very, very eventful um, discussion today, and I thank everybody for attending and participating. Okay, thank you very much. We do have thank another you. agenda item too, which is a work uh, work planning meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, those are free to go. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline, if I have a form to fill in for declaring an interest, can you email it me? Yeah, I'll email it to um, to those councillors that I declared their interest. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Um, this is that point. We just look at the, the work planning meeting. I think we've we've, we've looked at um, obviously a framework between now and May um, and trying to fit in as much as we can during that period. Um, can, can we just just go through that just very yeah. briefly and Would allow you? the opportunity for panel members to yeah. yeah so uh next meeting which is a members briefing is 25th of november at 10 a.m where as part of your role as the crime and disorder committee you'll be looking at domestic abuse so i've sent an email out for that um also following that meeting uh, there'll be a separate one on environmental strategy so obviously continuing your work within within this area um so that has been confirmed, even though um, we didn't have it at the time of public uh, publishing this agenda. Um, so con as your role as a crime and disorder committee, again, you've got a formal meeting 10th of February, um, which will have more of a re reflection on the COVID period. Um, you know, it will update you on everything that you have normally at that time of the year, but there'll also be that look at how it's been impacted uh, through the pandemic. So those are the main updates in terms of work planning chair. OK, thank you. Uh, panel members, did you wish to make any comments at all on that? I think I think what we've tried to do, um, I mean, we've had the Climate Change Commission, um, which has been ongoing all year. Uh, that's culminated in, in, a, in a, a report. We've got the environmental strategy, which I believe are coming back sometime or, or starting or coming back in, in January. So they, they are two key areas, two massive areas that, that will probably engulf, you know, most of the work moving forward in, you know, in the next few years. Uh, domestic abuse, um, there's been a lot of domestic re abuse reported during the COVID period, um, and that's going to tap into the uh, crime disorder panel in, in January, where lots of those statistics will be coming forward, um, you know, uh, from, from, from those various partners attending that meeting. Um, so we, we've tried, they are very, very large areas, very big areas, um, but what I've been um, trying to do is is not to try and do too much uh, because they are big areas. Um, like today, we've had the sudden report that's come back. Um, it has allowed the opportunity for, for panel members to, you know, express their concerns. It is a very, very important document, very, very important um, area, uh, and we never know whether we're going to get any, any more flooding in, in, in the future. So um, I hope, you know, obviously members have had, you know, have had a good opportunity today to ask the questions that they wanted to ask. Um, and I thought it was a very, very good meeting today. Um, so I, again, I'll, I'll just ask around if, if any if any member wishes to comment on on, on what Caroline just said there. Can I just ask, there was a question on domestic abuse. I asked at the uh, police and crime panel but they weren't able to answer it, not not properly. Is it OK if I ask it again? Yeah. So this it, one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we could um, kind of look for, you know, see if there's any questions prior to that briefing and then as like we do with every meeting, so we're kind of collectively bringing them together. Yeah, I'll send sure. it in to Is you. Is that OK? Yeah, so, yeah, send, it, send it to me. Um, Chair, I just also forgot to add on to that the one from the recommendation today that a member's briefing will be on the update uh, following the plans for um, prepare, preparing for winter uh, regarding the flooding. So that'll be another meeting that'll be scheduled in um, probably around, uh, I think, by end of March, we usually look at yeah, that. I mean, I mean, yeah, Phil did say about not, not to bring it back too soon. I don't fully um, understand because it, it yeah. does rain in January and February. <laughs> Yeah. Last year, so. We can liaise with Phil in the meantime, yeah. if you wish. OK. okay. Um, uh, would you like me to progress on to the forward plan? Yeah, all oh, right. OK, I've missed that one. Well, to be honest. Right, OK. What, 
what I will say is there's nothing on there specifically for the panel at the moment. So um, that's basically my update on that. There's a couple of areas going to OSMC um, and our members will be invited if they wish to attend. And that's mainly around the borough strategy and corporate yeah. plan areas. Uh, but in terms of any other areas, um, there's there's nothing on there at present. OK, thank you. Um, any comments from members? Chair, when are we going to get some uh, feedback about the RIP for street scene and cleansing? Oh, yeah. Right, OK, uh, it's a very valid point because we did um, that. That was uh, identified on the in fact, we just just passed the minutes for, for that. Yep. You know, where we right. Um, I, I, what I'll do uh, Ian, I'll I'll speak with Caroline. Um, I mean, and, and again, I, I understand that Peter Dale might be moving on to greater pastures, so there might be another um, individual taking over his role. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's very, yeah, yeah, th th there should be some kind of review or report that comes back. Yeah, and I mean, just, just to touch, just to touch upon something else you mentioned about the tree policy, because I think you, you contacted me in and yeah. um, I provided a briefing paper. Did the tree policy briefing paper go out to everybody on the panel? Uh, Chris circulated that, so I'd have to check. Yeah, because I don't know if it just went to to, to Ian and um, from da from Dave Ridge, I think it was. Yeah. If it hasn't, would you like it circulated? Yeah, I would like that treat right. that, that briefing policy going out to all our members. Yeah. I don't remember seeing it yet, so. Okay. It's only been recently. I mean, like, Ian, yeah. do you have knowledge that you received it? Yeah, I I I've received it, and that that's in part why I'm asking. Um, I mean, just a briefing paper on where we are with street scene because, to be honest, I'm not. Imp I'm still not impressed with this uh, tree policy. Um, we still, it's still street scene living. I don't know when, uh, in a world where the environment needs horticulture more than it's ever needed it, and they're still acting as if, uh, you know, we've got. 200 years before the air gets polluted. Right, okay. Caroline? Yeah, uh, Rapid Improvement Programme is um, on a briefing note section of the work plan, so we haven't forgotten about it. And we'll, what we'll do is look to chase that up next week, um, right. or request it rather, and I'll make sure the tree policy is circulated. Is that okay, Ian? That's fantastic. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, any, more, any more questions, guys? Anything else? I'll wrap it up. No. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you for everybody attending here today. Um, and have a good day. Have a good evening. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. You guys. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Keep rocking. Bye. Keep rocking. <laughs> right. See you later. See you.